I don't want to be your midlife crisis! glad to see you. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live episode number 277. Matter of fact is 277. How about that? There you go. What's happening? Go ahead, London. What do you say, John? I hope you're well. Uh, good to see everybody. Vinny Dolk, what's up, brother? Joe Frank, good. John, what's up? The gang's all here. Sometimes, sometimes, I'm really looking forward to doing this show. Today's one of those days. I'm excited to have this guy on. You know, real New York guy and uh, a, re a real pleasant individual. So really looking forward to it. Um, who will be on the big 300? I don't know yet. I really haven't. I don't know yet. I mean, we know what the wish list is, right? I mean, you know, hey. Fucking Alan, what's up? Nonfiction represent New Jersey Metal. What's happening? Hope you're well, buddy. Good, good. Yeah. After the after the last few hours I have had, I I have definitely been looking forward to an afternoon with you mugs. Well, thank you. Yeah, we've come to crush Alan Tecchio. That's right. Good. Speaking speaking of crushing. 
Speaking of crushing, what's up? What's up? It's crushing. You, don't have, you don't have tattoos on your knuckles like Sid the Kid? I don't have tattoos. What would I put? I don't know. You should put DJ Sid the Kid on your knuckles. Railroad. <laughs> put L I double R. The uh no, I never went for the knuckle. Never went to the hands or the fingers or the neck. Bro, I got I got nothing. Dude, I have I don't have any tattoos on my arms or anything. They're all they're Just, all on my chest, my back, my legs, my feet. <laughs> nothing on my arms. Oh, you, you went know, for the hey. feet. Oh, hey, what's up, brother? Yeah. Yeah. What's going this on? This is a, you know what? I'm excited for today. He, he's he's one of those like you were saying, such a New York staple, you know. I have a picture. I have a picture of you and him. I, I mean, I feel like, is it not right to show it? I mean, but you're not going to be around later, so maybe we right. can show it now. Yeah, right? it's it's a fun one. I mean, all right, it's a great here's a great shot, memories. Here's a shot of you. Here's a shot of you, on the right, with a with 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 hair. That uh, our guest on the left. Uh, of course, this is when he was playing with Marky Ramon in The Intruders. Or Mar Mar and uh, I don't know, I don't know the guy's name in the middle. I, was, I guess I feel yeah. bad. That's the guitar player, and I cannot remember his name. I, I apologize. Feel bad. But um, I like they that. were really, really good band, and it, it was a lot of fun. At the time, I was working with a, an author who was going to write Marky's biography, which he eventually put years later put out a biography, but with a different person. And and he did not end up going with that writer, but we had a lot of fun. We spent a lot of time, saw a lot of our intruder shows. I remember eating bagels with Arturo Vega and Marky nice. and like a lot of, lot of great, a lot of fun times. And uh, just to, he, he didn't end up clicking with the author of the book. And that was that, but. Yeah, look at all those robots. Yeah, he's a collector. Oh, we'll, he has we'll, some great we'll, toys We'll there. get into all that, yeah. Yeah, I, I like that. I like. Can I quote? Can I use that quote from before? Which was, "I feel bad." I, I do feel bad. The uh, yes, I'm of course. You can have that. No, this one's called "I feel bad." <laughs> bad, 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 bad. I feel bad. Banana, banana, banana. Bad. It's, I feel. Instead of I feel good like James Brown. I feel bad. Motherfuckers, <laughs> I knew I would now. Anyway, so instead of photo of the day, uh, we're going to bring back a fan favorite. We're going to do set list of the day. So here we go. Identify this set list. Uh, what band is this? Is this? What is this? Good it luck. Is. Set list of the day. What, who, what band is this? What do we got? Ah, that's a good one. That's kind of an easy one. Yeah, I would say it's pretty yeah. much right from the get go. Yeah, right. The yep. uh, and that, it's amazing that there's that's a lot of songs, but uh, yeah, that's a lot of songs. And it's actually a double sided set list. It's the same set list, handwritten on one side and typed on the other. Is that right? Yeah, I guess I maybe they did two different days, but it ended up being identical. Is it AFI, Sid says? <laughs> Is it MDC? Is it Millions of Dead Cops? Is it MDC? Is it MDC? Yeah, this is MDC with 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 the favorites. John Wayne was a Nazi. Oh, uh, yeah. Church and State, Kill the Light, Dick for Brains. Dick for Brains, Dick for Brains. Why am I Dick for Brains? Yep. I'm a big Corporate Death Burger fan myself. Corporate Death Burger. Huh? Yo, listen. He was... The, him and the dude that was on the last show, Dave Tree, were the most manic guests we've ever had. Oh, my the God. The, the pre-show with Dave Dichter was so much fun. And you were trying to bottle him up like, no, 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 no save it. We're about to, no, save it. All right, here's, anyway. an, e here's an easy one. <laughs> as quick as you can respond. Who is this? <laughs> Let's see. Is 
Is it Slayer? <laughs> I think it's ABBA. Yeah. Is it is it Agnostic Front? No, it's not. Not Agnostic Front. Although I'd like to I'd like to see Agnostic Front do this set list. That'd well, the give cool. the giveaway of which particular band this is is in the mix there is right in the middle and that way you could tell exactly which era we're talking about well it's a little confusing when you see attitude and rise and fall because attitude's a bad brain song and rise Correct. and fall is a leeway song so then we know exactly what this is this is the this was the is it uh, the agros oh very oh. much very much not chromags 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 yes the chromags this is Chromag's JM, actually. Chromag's JM. All right, here's the- here's a real challenge. All right, last one. Here's a real, here's a real challenge. You know what? Let's see who gets this one. Here's a clue. Well, it, this is a hardcore show. Oh, so you don't this need is that a good clue. one. Yep. Hey, Sid Marla. Get this one. What's up, Marla? Hope you're well out there in Portland. Okay, come on, anybody. Sid the Kid will get this one. What do we got? Uh, Listen, now here's a guy who actually plays in this band, who who actually played in this band, who who got it, all right? (laughs) Yes, it's Sub-Zero, Sub-Zero. Yes, it is. That's right, that's right, Larry the Hunter, your alma mater. Yep, yep, here you go. I love the spider. I, 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 I love when yeah. people decorate their set list a little bit, you know? All right, one, one more. Might be a I'm little f- out of your... Listen, might be, might be a little out of your hardcore punk rock comfort zone here. But no. let's try... I'll give you a clue. There's a tie-in with today's guest. Here you go. <laughs> right answers only, please. Ah, there we go. This was such a good show. Right answers only, please. Is it Billy Joel? Is it? And I got, I got COVID Taylor Swift. Show. Is it Hootie and the Blowfish? <laughs> you know that. You know what? Hootie and the Blow, Hootie and the Blowfish has been spared my wrath on this show. It's like they really I have. Go, I always go off on Billy Joel or Phil Collins. You know, another band and Sticks. Another band that I kind of put in that in that category is is hootie and the blowfish well they had their that guy went like full country now the singer yo fuck that band (laughs) (laughs) wow i don't give a fuck if he went country i bet his country shit sucks too all right no mercy for hootie no yeah i turned around and it was hootie and he was with (laughs) the blowfish all right, oh, yeah, here, funny. Here, here we go. All right, yes, that's right. Allie, you got it. It's Jesse Mallon. Yes. Yep, Jesse Mallon. Yeah, that, that was actually the, uh, the December Howie Pyro benefit um, from two years ago, that, uh, right. which was an incredible, incredible lineup of bands. And, uh, and I, got, I did. I went, home, I went home with COVID, and I had to take Christmas week off from work. It was a win-win. Did I ever tell the story on here about how one time when I was out with Biohazard, we almost we almost got in a scrap with Echo and the Bunny Men? Really? Yo. Can those yo, guys fight? Yo, those two, yo, Echo and the Bunny Men ain't soft, bro. Echo and the Bunny Men will bring the ruckus. They're, they're not they're they're not they're not soft, those dudes. Dude, I, I got no problem with the Killing Moon. That's a great song. What happened was, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say, I'll say, yeah, right. It's crazy, right? This is what happened. We were at catering at one of these festivals, and I was with Evan Seinfeld, and we were online, and I don't know what happened. There was some sort of like, I don't know, maybe someone got in front of somebody else, or I don't remember that part of it. But there was some sort of, and, and we were like, I don't know, maybe you know, we sort of, we sort of, you know, shrugged them off, or, or like. <laughs> The fuck out of here, jerk off or something. You know, this was this was back in the nineties when you did shit like that. Like, the fuck out of here, you know. And uh, so 
me and Evan left catering and like, yo, they got their boys together and we turned around and it was Echo. And he was with <laughs> the Bunny Man. Bunny Man. <laughs> and they meant business. And they meant business. Echo and the Bunny Man, don't, don't, don't sell them short. That's some bunny business right there. Yo, you know who's it? Yo, you know who other, who else was was a tough fucking band? Was the Stranglers, man? You want to fuck with the Stranglers, man? Those dudes will fuck you up. Who was the fight that you got into that like Alago was there too? When you all jumped into it together, was that with Sub Zero? Oh yeah, when I was out with when I was managing Sub Zero and we were out on the Misfits tour in Europe, and Alago was with us, and Alago was drinking. Alago was drinking at the time. Yo, when when Alago, yo, when 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 Alago drink used to drink, yo, he he want to fight. He like <laughs> he like fucking get the fuck out of here. Like you got little a lot little yo Alago Alago's a Alago's a tough kid. Yo yo he's he's a he's a, a Puerto Rican kid went to public public school in the in, in New York. Yo Alago Alago would scrap and and in the Alago film we talk about that. He got into some scrap, beat the fuck out of some kid, you know, in in, in the parking lot, you huh. know. Yeah. Yeah, we fought everybody on that tour, yep. Yeah, so so listen. Y- you know what? Mad props to Echo and the Bunny Mun. I I love I love I love their music. You know, it was just some dumb shit, but funny story. <laughs> it was Echo yeah. and he was with the Bunny Man. The Bunny Man. Nice. You know? So there you go. All right. Well, I'm off uh, I'm off to Are see you? Glenn Hughes tonight. Oh, you see Glenn Hughes? I'm gonna go see Glenn Hughes tonight at the Paramount. The voice, the voice of metal, the voice of rock, with and he's playing with Ingve Malmsteen. I, I've always wanted to see. I've always wanted to see Glenn Hughes, man. Oh yeah, no, it's gonna be awesome. I'm excited. He's on my. He's on my favorite Deep Purple records, man. So, that's great shit. You know, pictures to follow. You'll see. I'm sure he does like getting tighter and mystery. I've been mistreated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they, I think he's doing all purple tonight, too. Yeah. So. You know what my favorite Deep Purple record is? I People think I do. Like, what? I think you just told me. Come Taste the Band. I love that record. Anybody that's, know that's... about that? Anybody know about Deep Purple, Come Taste the Band? All right. Quick trivia question. And I know you're going to. Who plays who who plays guitar on Come Taste the Band? I know who it is. I ain't saying. Yeah. And he's tragically no longer with us as well. Yeah, he died. Di- he died young, yeah. Yep. Crazy. Yep, yep. Yeah, what's the band he was in? Black Black Mountain Communion or something? Black Black Country Communion was the band that he was just in recently with uh, Joe Bonamassa. No, Blackmore. Blackmore was not in Deep Purple at the time. Blackmore does not play on Come Taste the Band. That is, that is correct. He plays on the other two records that Glenn Hughes sings on. He plays on Burn and Stormbringer. Yep. You know? Great records also. There you got it. It's Tommy Boland. Tommy Boland played oh, yeah. guitar on that. Oh, yeah. Fucking people. All right, bro. <laughs> I, let's get the show on the Let's get the show on the road. I love that. You know, that's a good one. Let's get the show. Let's get the show on the road. Fuck it. Let's do this. En- enough. Enough here. Let's get this fucking show on the road. Bring it to motherfuckers, man. That's it. That's it. And we'll try to get Hootie as our three hundredth guest. What's that dude's? That's not his name, Hootie. No, that's da- Daryl Dar- Rucker. Dar- Darius Rucker. The fuck that dude. <laughs> Seriously, man. And on that note, yeah, I'll talk to you later. This is the one, the only New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Where else do you get humor and punk rock history entwined in one? We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Upstate Records, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals like yourself who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and believe it or not, true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Come on now. 
the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry designed for a boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as to style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Ringo Starr, Greg Rolay, and Agnostic Front. Information online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.texassilverrush.com. That said, let's clear the deck. What the heck? Everybody okay? Nobody's killing each other in the chat room? Lock and load. Let's get this show on the road. You know what I'm saying? Checking in from vacation? Well, thanks. I'm sorry we're cutting into your vacation time, Ray Hogan. You know? There you go. What's the story behind the Hootie hate? He sucks! How's that sound? I don't hate him. He sucks. That shit sucks. You know who else sucks? Fucking Dave Matthews Band. Yo, fuck the Dave Matthews Band. This is coming from a guy that loves the Grateful Dead. Fuck the Dave Matthews Band. I hate that shit, man. And you know who else sucks? Fish. Fuck fish, too. Anyway. Sorry. Fit, yo, my, 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 my dislike for disdain for fish is a whole nother thing, man. That's a whole nother story. But let's not go there. Let's bring our guest on. All right? All right? Everything cool? Sorry, not sorry. Swedish fish are awesome. This is true. Yep. Here we go. Today's guest is a native New Yorker born and raised in Brooklyn. He's a proficient musician and actor known for his work with Marky Ramon and the Intruders, Jesse Mallon, Ryan Adams, The Alarm, Willie Nile, and many, many others. Please welcome, coming at us from Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, Mr. Johnny Pie, Johnny Paisano. Hey, hey. <laughs> what do you got? <laughs> you know, dude, you're cracking me up over here. I got, I got to tell you, I, I share your dislike for Hootie and the Blowfish. And then when he did his country thing, I'm not a, I don't like new country. You give me some Merle Haggard. Oh, you yeah. give me some real deal country. Oh, yeah. That's different. But oh, this yeah. new shit, I just, I, I'm just not about it. I just, the Nashville stuff, it just blows my mind that people like that crap at all. I just, you, you, you know where, you know where I go to in that situation? I, you know, I, I go to traditional bluegrass. Like I, right. I, I, enjoy, I enjoy traditional blue. I, and yeah. there's some artists like, um, like Billy Strings, you know, that, 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 that are like, that, that's, I love that. I, I love bluegrass. Yeah. I, lo I love traditional bluegrass, you know, stuff, stuff yeah, like that, just, you know, and, but that new country shit, I don't know what that oh, is. And these white dudes are like wearing cowboy hats and they're rapping. Yeah. In the middle of this this yeah. song that they get like this hybrid thing. And I just think it's a bunch of guys sitting in a circle with a like a rhyming dictionary and they're just making up songs. They're like cookie cutter things. Got you know, with I don't know. I just never I just I just can't get my head around it. I just don't like it. But people, it exploded. I mean, that 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 whole genre is nuts. What do we know? We're dinosaurs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tell you, like, I, I, you guys are musicologists. I would, I would fail half this trivia that you guys are throwing out there. But um, when you put up the set list to MDC, yep. I was like, wait a minute. And it, it took a couple of seconds, but I got it. I was good friends with um, Harry Viderci. And there's Harry Viderci is the drummer of the Sick Fucks. If you remember. You remember oh, this? yeah. Yeah. Right. Like Russell, right. the singer. The bass player was named Stink. And right. then uh, Tish and Snooky, that way, later went on to do Manic of Panic, uh, uh, the hair dye, huge success. Uh, I'm sad to say, uh, whoever doesn't know this, that Harry, he passed away from the pandemic, the COVID. He was, uh, he was a COVID denier and he, he was in the hospital and his cousin was his doctor. And his cousin actually said, listen, I got this medicine for you. You just need to take this vaccine you're literally going to die if I don't give this to you. And he's like, this is government shit. I'm not, he just went punk rock all the way down to the very end. And it wound up killing him. It, it, it just was a, one of these crazy things. And during this pandemic, I, I got to tell you my whole life, you know, you know, anything the government tells us to do, I'm like, fuck you. It's not, you forget it. You know, it's a lie. You know, they have an agenda, whatever. This is the first time I'm like, I think I'm going to listen this time. <laughs> I'm gonna and I actually, 
I did get the vaccine. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's that's a, that's a that's a big can of worms, man. You know, the yeah, whole vac- the whole vaccine oh, thing. We tr- we try to avoid that here, man. No, you know, I know. Like, we'll avoid the politics too. But I'll tell you back back when Harry's daughter was nine years old, her, Astara, her name is, and she got up on stage with MDC uh, and sang uh what do you call um and sang that song uh fuck what was it again she sang one of the mdc songs john wayne was a nazi no <laughs> dick, uh, for bra- dick for brains no cop not cop killer uh what the fuck is the name of that song again all right well anyway she got up there and she ripped it at nine years old she ripped every word and they well, the, the band was like fucking blown away by it it was go. pretty amazing yeah so let's let's chop it up a little bit um hey want to shout out my brother evan b stone out on the west coast love you bro um how did you come up did you grow up in a musical household how did music come into your life uh actually i i didn't my uh my father was a working man so was my mother she she was seriously working two jobs you know after they got separated whatever they just came from a working household the um uh my mother my my father's mother Mm -hmm. uh was an opera singer before she got married and uh was one of the old school things like there was a there's a record somewhere with her on it and she uh it was one of those old school things where her husband was like look i don't like you hanging out in those clubs you either want to do the music thing or if you marry me you got to give that up and it's a sad thing but that's that's what that's what it was then. But uh, my aunt, her daughter, was a keyboard player. So that that's the only musical influence in my in my family. The rest of them were, you know, were hardworking people or some stuff I'm not supposed to talk about. If you know what I mean, you know. Well, in you that grew mess- up, well, well you, <laughs> you, you 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 grew up in the bastion of of that activity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Bensonhurst, um, Brooklyn, Bath Benson- Beach, Bensonhurst was the so, heart. So you you of did that. you grew, you grew up as a kid in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, right? Yeah, and and I I I know in my heart that you know when Giuliani became mayor, mm-hmm. the first thing he did was his job was to get rid of the mafia and try to like you know mm-hmm. put, you know put as many of them away as possible, mm-hmm. and the rest of them ran to Jersey. Right. So when the when the Sopranos came out and their their whole operation was in Jersey. I feel like if Giuliani didn't do that, I think the Sopranos would have been, yeah, maybe Howard Beach, you know, Bensonhurst. It would have been New York. It wouldn't have been Jersey. But that's that. That's just my, you know, so my so own so you so you grew up you grew up in Bensonhurst, and you are yeah. of Italian American heritage, correct? I am. This Johnny Pisano is actually my real name, which people <laughs> people right. question that. I've had to pull out my driver's license a bunch right. of times. Like, oh, that's a great stage name. I'm like, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I get it too. Drew Stone can't be your name, right? It's that's like, right. you know, it's too. You you already right. sound famous. Drew Stone works, but I yeah, born, like, I was I was born into this world with a great stage name. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like growing up, like, how do you rebel? against all that as a, and so as a rebellious teenager when i was young i rebelled against all that and like all these guidos and you know my we used to call them cousins back in the day cougines. and they're all driving around in their father's and uncle's cadillac and saying oh right. you know who my father is you know who my uncle is and for me to rebel against that was music and and rock and roll and then as soon as i discovered punk rock i'm like wow so i i I, I adhered to that. And when I started dressing freaky and, and, and you know, starting becoming, uh, ex- expressing my individuality, you know, they would make fun of me. And, you know, they would, I, I would wear these long coats. Oh, oh, boy, George. Yeah, look at boy, George. You know, they didn't know what to call me. Right. Hats. I, I would dye my hair funny colors. What, what was the first music that you sort of, that, that, that spoke to you? Well, it's a, I mean, when I was 10 years old, me and my friend, Mike Buffer, who, we're still buddies today. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he, uh, me and him would stand in my bedroom with had a boombox, and right. I would have a baseball bat and pretend to be Gene Simmons, and he oh, would have right. a paddle ball because we used to play paddle ball in the park across the street, and he would have a paddle and he pretend to be Ace Freely. Mm-hmm. So a couple of years later, his neighbor, 
was a guitar. Uh, they had a wedding band, and he would he 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 was a guitar teacher. So I said, I want to learn how to play bass. He wants to learn how to play guitar. He says, Look, I'll teach you both at the same time. Nice. I'll teach you. And he would he would teach us while simultaneously blowing pot smoke in our face. Emil Cristatello, <laughs> I'm calling him out right now. And he um still still around. He's a great guy. And uh, if it wasn't for him, I don't know what where what would happen. But we had this desire to to start a band together. So I never learned. Most bass players learn how to play guitar first, right? And then they go to bass later. I I started on bass, right? And um and from there um. His brother, Mike Mike Buffett's brother, Billy, uh, he he he's gone too. Uh, rest his soul. Uh, he was into all this cool music, and he said he would come up to us and go, "You got to check out this new band. No one's heard of them yet. They're called the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Mm. There's this new band, Fishbone. Like he mm. would get all these obscure bands, and he would throw them at us. And now we're 13. You know, years have gone by." With 13, 14 years old. Living, living, living in Bensonhurst, that's like Saturday Night Fever territory, right? I mean, more than you know. Yeah. Do you, yeah. <laughs> you know the beginning scene of Saturday Night Fever when he's walking on uh, it's 86th Street with the paint can? Yeah. That's four blocks from my house. Right. And he goes he goes into the, the pizzeria, Lenny's. Well, right. Lenny's just literally closed down. Jenny, Lenny's just closed. Like, just closed. Yeah. Fucked up, man. Yeah, yeah. And I did a. Ironically, when I um, I wanted to put out my own record, I mean, we'll get into that, whatever. Um, I had this this campaign a friend of mine told me to do. They, they said, uh, I need money to record it. So you do these uh, these Kickstarter things. It was called Pledge back in 2016, right? I did a pledge campaign and I, I did five videos and I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I, I saw the them. first video. Great. They're yeah, great. I did a parody yeah. of John Travolta walking yeah, yeah. with the paint can. Okay. I had a seventies office and I went to Lenny's. Yeah, so yeah, and and, and then I said, you know, this is Benson Earth, blah, blah, blah. I got a big announcement to make in five days. And then the next day I did a different video with a pizza and then a different video for five days. No one knew what I was doing until the fifth day I announced I want to make my own record and I need support in this pledge thing. And it did well. And I wound up recording my record from that. Can but yeah. Kathleen, these clips are all on YouTube and they're great. If you, if anybody look them up, Johnny Paisano, it's in four parts. Also real quick, yeah. I, wa I want to shout out coming at us from Serbia. Serbia. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Sir, Dan, Sir Dan Hardy. I hope you're well in Serbia. Uh, Amazing. You know, thanks for tuning in, man. And, and we're, we're, we're happy you're here with us. Um, Absolutely. Is it true that um, your first base was a $90 cameo base? It was, you know, okay. So in Bensonhurst, there were two music stores, Maggio's, which is still there, and Bath Music. Bath Music, this was before like all the giant, you know. This is before Sam. Go well, no, Sam yeah. Goody actually existed in one store, but this is before. Sam Ash, the, yes. this is, Sa Sa excuse me, Sam yeah. Ash, right. This is before Manny's was down there, Sam right. Ash was down there, but this is before Guitar Center, like in every all fucking the town in America. Right. Exactly. It was all mom it was and pop. Just, it was all mom and pop. And, and literally, we called this place, it was Bath Music, but we would always call them mom and pop. That's yeah. literally. And we yeah. would go in there, and the, the woman would be, she, she would cook spaghetti in the back or whatever, and she's like, she had these little hairs coming out of her chin, <laughs> like this old woman. And they, we'd always feel like we got a little ripped off. You know, they would like charge a little more, but they'd give you a free strap. Like, yeah, right, you know what right, I mean? right, right. And have some spaghetti come in the back. Like it was that kind of a store. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I got my bass from there. And it was a it was a copy Fender Precision, a cameo. It's still in my garage, which has gone through all these years. Who knows? It's stuffed in the back somewhere. The, the neck is probably warped or whatever. Wow, but one day I'd love to- Amazing you still have it, man. I do. And, and I have this fantasy one day of maybe playing it and like breaking it on stage or something like pull a Paul Simon on or something and just break it one day. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah. So, but then I said to myself back then, I'm like, if these music store, like, Oh, by the way, you said Sam Ash, the first Sam Ash store wasn't that far from me, but it was in a different neighborhood. It was in Kings highway. I think it was on Kings highway. Yeah. And it was just, and Sam Ash was just a mom pa store back yeah, then yeah. too, yeah, yeah. before they exploded. And I Absolutely. remember saying to myself, just like, you know, when you're a kid and you really like this band and then you turn around and you see some like 12 year old wearing the button of your favorite band and you're like, ah, it's all fucked up now. I can't like this band anymore. I said the same thing about 
if 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 these music stores ever became commercial, um, I'm I'm just gonna give up music. And then before you knew it, there were commercials on TV for Sam Ash, and I obviously didn't give it up. But like it would it would annoy me because I wanted like the bands I liked to be like just between me and my friends. Like I never wanted them to blow up. Do you know that feeling? That segues. You know that segues into one of your early musical influences, which is The Clash. And The Clash, yeah. The Clash is that band you're talking about, which was, everybody loved The Clash, but yeah. you know, when they got popular, everybody loved The Clash when they were playing right. Bonds or whatever. Right, but right. The, the Clash is the epitome of the bands that was like, you know, yeah. that, happens with a lot, that happens with a lot of artists. But I remember everyone was like, you know, People were people were angry. It was like when the Clash got yeah. popular because but, the, the Clash was so great early on, you know. Right. But the thing is, now that now that I'm older, like I realize it's actually a great thing that they got popular. Like people were people were like, "Oh yeah, fuck Billy Joe and Green Day," and I'm like, "No, no, no, fuck you," because how else you want to you want to be a, a low band and and play in front of thirty people or a hundred people and get your message to a hundred people? That's great. These guys are getting that message, that punk rock message. American idiot, come on. They got that punk rock message out to stadiums. So it's well, actually better that they got popular and they never lost their roots. Well, sometimes, they never sold out some, like they say sold out. You know, that's a bunch of bullshit. I think sometimes bands like Green Day, Nirvana, Bruce Springsteen, they, right. just, they catch a moment in time. Yeah. You know, they catch a moment. Like Green Day would never ever have been that big but at that moment in time a lot of roads converged yeah. you know and, and and same with and say and i know you've played with i know you've played with bruce springsteen i i think you know you know bruce springsteen was great his first couple records were fucking great and yeah. then born then born in the usa and it was like yeah. how and it was like what, Blew up. what, yeah, yeah. what the fuck yeah. is this you but know? now we're older. Like I, I want these people to have success. Sure. Like you know what I mean. Sure. When you're younger, sure. you just have a different way of thinking. Sure. You know they try to say that about Rancid. I'm like, whoa, chill out. <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. So, so uh, early musical influences, and 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 I, I, I lifted this off of uh, from doing my homework. Kiss, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Bob Marley, The Clash, Dead Kennedys, Dead Boys, <laughs> and and yeah. and you Pretty cite and, and you cite. Paul Simonon is being a huge uh, influence on your bass playing. Yeah. Well, all right. So when I first started playing bass, like I just wanted to get a hold of anything that had good bass in it. Right. So like any Motown, like oh, James Jameson, anything from sure, that sure. God sure. of bass played on, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and obviously those you know, cheesy, you know, those, what I think cheesy now I make fun of Gene Simmons, you know, and then even rush where it's like not cool to, to like them. I get it. But like when you're a kid, I'm like, holy shit, listen to that. You know, prog rock or whatever. King Crimson was that trippy, that weird, sure. odd timing shit. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and and that was before I discovered, you know, when my like I said my friend's brother started turning us on to bands like, you know, the the the, the Dead Milkmen and the Headlickers. And mm. I'm like, what what's that? You know, and like and and all of a sudden it to me, because those bass players really just followed the guitar player. There was no real like great bass lines, you know. There mm -hmm. was once I'd get fucking Dickies, they were amazing, you know, Dead Kennedy's musicians were amazing. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for the most part, all these bands I loved, it wasn't about the musicianship anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it was about, wait, you could you could have a platform and you could the thing I was rebellious about, I could actually have a soapbox. I could I could be pissed off and say something about it. These guys were almost teaching me what was going on in their area. Yeah. You know, or, or going on in the world, Cor corporate death burger, Ronald McDonald. What do you mean? I like McDonald's. What are you trying to say? Like, and then you asking friends, like, what does that mean? The guns of Brixton. What is that? What, what's, where's yeah, Brixton? Yeah. Like you start asking questions yeah. and I never even asked these questions in school. So mm -hmm. like, like uh, Jesse, to quote Jesse Mallon, like, like Joe Strummer was almost like a history teacher to me because mm -hmm. I would question his lyrics. And then we went on to, um, you know, realizing that does punk rock really have to be a sound? Is it all about a sound? Or was Bob Dylan a punk? Abs to me, absolutely. And, you're, you know, your subscribers and whatever, the comments, you guys can go off on me and tell me I'm wrong and tell me to go fuck myself. That's fine. We all have no, our No, no, we're on the, we're on the, we, we, we're on the same. Where, 
we're yeah. on the same page with this. It, you know, things get things get blurred. A absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, sometimes, yeah, punk rock is about a sound. But is it or is it more of a state of mind? Like, you know, and then all of a sudden somebody said, check out this band, The Clash. And then I was like, whoa, because you have these great bass lines because mm -hmm. I was so hungry for bass as mm -hmm. a, a young bass player and these lyrics at the same time in the same band. Yep. I was like, oh my God. So I discovered heaven at that moment. And mm -hmm. I became just engulfed in them, wanting to know the lyrics and the, and the musicianship. And then the Dead Kennedys were amazing musicians. Yeah, yeah, they were great. You know, yeah. yeah. So, so first, first couple of bands, um, Bundle of Nerves, Complete Control, yeah. Rude Boys, and then that led you to Crispy, <laughs> Crispy Brown. But Bundle yeah. of Nerves was that's a great that's a great band name. Bundle of Nerves was Thanks. that the, your first band? Yeah, we were okay. So we were fourteen, and me and Mike Buffer, same dude, right? Yeah. Who before, I don't want to forget to say this. Me and Mike grew up together, and we were in Crispy Brown together. I'll go back, but I need to go forward for a moment. And while we were in Crispy Brown, we were record we were rehearsing at Rockaway Studios. Oh wow! And in the basement of Rockaway Studios, old there was school. this guy, old school shit. There was a guy down there working on Mesa Boogie Amps, you know, Mark yep. Snyder. And Mark was a tech. So he taught Mike Buffer how to be a tech. Hmm. And Mike Buffer is always on the road today with Maroon 5. Wow. So I'm talking like he's gone from Jane's Addiction wow. to Alanis Morissette. Like he's been in so many. Yo, Maroon 5, that's a gig. Uh, to be a tech, that's a gig. That's you know it. So, yeah, so he's doing well financially. He's going to the Middle East and Japan and all kinds of shit. So anyway, back to back up to bundle of nerves we're 14 years old mike's brother billy buffer he uh turning us all together he was in a band called pressure pressure and the singer of that band was blaze del bianco mm. so blaze had these original songs and he said look why don't you and he had a rehearsal studio on bath avenue and bay 19th right a couple blocks of where we live so we were up there and jamming with Blaze all the time. And he was like, look, I want to give you some of my original songs. So he managed us. He came up with the name Bundle of Nerves. So here we are, 14 years old. 14? Everyone in the and band we, was 14? We were all 14. Well, we got a drummer who was a little older. And then we wound up getting a singer, Carmelo Di Baltolo, who was in Beat Brigade. If you know Beat Brigade is the ska band. He's mm -hmm. still in Beat Brigade. <laughs> we got him from the from the the back of the Village Voice. Do you remember, like, when you you flip through? You know, a lot of people don't know about the back the whole, of the Village the Voice. The whole world revolved around yeah, the Village Voice. Everything. I, I got my apartment yeah. through the Village Voice. Right. I got you know uh, we what who was playing when the movie yeah. uh, Village Voice was everything. Man. But there was like a there was a section in there of like you know a uh, man seeking woman woman seeking man and then weird shit like man seeking woman to act like a doberman pincher naked with a <laughs> bottle like baby bottles like weird shit they were doing back in it we would read that but then past that were these public notices were these uh you know drummers looking for whatever so sure. we got our musicians from like the, the classified Voice. ads the, yeah it was like yeah. that. And um, yep. I, I miss I miss those days, man. Just the yeah, memories yeah. of that. So anyway, um, we had this band, Bundle of Nerves, and we played a bar called The Dive. It was a venue called The Dive. It was on 8th Avenue, like off 14th Street or 13th wow. Street back then. Yeah. And we played there more than once. We weren't even allowed to get in. But this guy, Bla uh, Blaze Del Bianco, uh, got us in. And Blaze later... Uh, to, to brag about Blaze, Blaze was an amazing human being. He was a fireman. His brother was a fireman. His father was a fireman, and they named him Blaze. But his real name, Biagio in Italian, which means Blaze, he, uh, when 9-11 happened, he was already retired. He went in, and he was in the bucket brigade with everybody, and he caught mm. that. He caught that shit. And mm. years later, it wound up giving him cancer, and he, oh. he it took him it took him like 10 years to die of, oh. of finally it was bone cancer so i'm giving props to blaze for uh being such a, an amazing part and, of and my this, childhood this is, and, this is uh, a what happened but i don't think there's no pictures of bundle of nerves <laughs> no but is, is, is it, it, this, this is an oldie right oh shit yeah that was see that <laughs> so that was uh that bass i'm playing that you can't even see i bought a i bought a rickenbacker and um after the after the cameo, I saved my money and uh, and then my birthday and my my mother chipped in and and uh, got me this Rickenbacker. Oh, and Rick! I, 
Yeah, the old Rickenbacker. And, um, cool. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I can asshole. I sold it. I should have never sold that bass because uh, there's yeah, so many. Well. There's, there's just a totally different sound. The band, the Jam. You know, there's so many. The Paul McCartney played one. Like, there's so many different bands that have uh, Rickenbackers. I want. I want to push it forward because there, there's a, yeah. there's a lot of ground to cover. And oh and yeah. <laughs> for those watching, what we're going to do is we're going to try to do music in the first part of the show. And then we're going to come back off the break. We're, we're going to bring uh, a friend of the show's on, Robbie Steve Davidson, who plays guitar with The Exploited, who's a filmmaker uh, who I'm involved with with my new film. He's going to come on board. And the second half of the show, we're going to do film st your film stuff. But, nice. but let, let's jump forward a little bit. Bundle of Nerves, Complete Control, um, uh, Rude Boys. You end, up right. in crispy, you end up in Crispy Brown. Right. And, and you're playing The Bitter End. And... And and somehow you get involved with Woody Harrelson, the actor. Oh, give, yeah, give that us, was. <laughs> give, give us give us the Woody Harrelson. Yeah. It's, a great, it's a great story. You're, yeah. you're playing like the bitter end, which is still there, right? right? The yeah, yeah, it's still, still there. there to this day. I mean, you you, you were wood yeah. you were woodshedding, fucking right? right, paying your dues at the bitter end. How does Woody Harrelson come into your so, life? Uh, well, we would we would we would do it pretty good, and uh, uh, Crispy Brown. And uh, we were an original band where like Rude Boys and Complete Control, we were a Dictators and Clash cover band mixed with a few originals. Dictators and, I was, Dictators and the Clash. And Clash cover band. And I was a huge Dick Panatoba fan. Wow. I would never tell him how big of a fan I was. Yeah, right. I became, you don't became want to friends do with him. I don't want to tell him. <laughs> but after I became friends with him. You'll but, never um, hear the end of it. No, I know. But I still love that guy. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Um, so Crispy Brown would play The Bitter End and... Um, one night, the place was crowded, and we were done playing, and this guy comes up to me and says, hey, I've been looking all over the city for a bass player for this band I'm starting, and I, 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 I like, you know, I like your playing. I'd, I'd love for you to play with me, and I look down, and I'm like, okay, Woody Harrison. Like, it was just like this weird, I wasn't even sure it was him. So he said, give me your number. So I was like, all right, I gave him my number. And as I gave him my number, people started realizing who it was. Because, I mean, it's the, the middle of the city and people are like, holy shit. So they started bothering him for autographs and stuff. Sure. So he left. I said, I'm never going to hear from this guy. The next day he calls me. And this was 1990, uh, 1995. And I had never even met a famous person at this time of my life, you know. Right, so right. I was like, and I was working for FedEx. And, you know, like I told you before, I come from like a working family. My sure. Sure. My father would, 103, you know, fever, dying, throwing up. He'd Going go to work. work. That's the way it was. That's the way we, that's the way we all grew up. Yep. And so my work ethic is still strong, but I, I get it from my parents. And just like that, I was afraid to quit my FedEx job because I would have had to quit to join Woody Harrelson. You know what this so, reminds, you know what this reminds me of? Just a quick segue yeah. is. Pete Steele from Typo Negative worked for the Parks Department. When right. Typo when Typo Negative started doing well, he didn't want to quit. Uh, the, like uh, Typo Negative went on tour with Motley Crue, and he was calling in sick every day to work. You know, like yeah. he took two weeks of vacation and then was calling in sick. Right. Eventually, eventually, eventually he had to quit. But you know, the Parks Department, you know, it's is a, a good, good job. It's a good gig, yeah, man. Yeah, dude, that's you know? a city job. You could retire all this. Yeah. So ironically, I pulled a similar trick because, okay, Woody Harrelson did call me the next day wow. and we were making plans and he lived up the Taconic somewhere. Sure. And, um, you know, he said, listen, I'll pay you. It was, I forget what it was like. I'll pay you like $500 a week. You come and rehearse with me and then we'll go on tour. And I'm like scared shit. Okay. Cause I got my band crispy Brown that I put my heart and soul into and the bandmates were kind of making me feel a little guilty about the Woody Harrelson thing. And then <clears throat> I had the job. So I claimed the back injury for the job. And, and I, I lied and said my back, well, I had something wrong with my back. So I could go up and, and go see Woody Harrelson. So I went up and I hung out with him. And it was just a day or two, came back and got freaked out from the whole thing. It was a stupid thing. I don't know what would have happened, but I called him and I, I literally just said, listen, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Like, uh, I, I'm a, I can't quit my job. It was like one of those 
like I it was right uh, it, it uh, was right there right here opportunity right knocked and I slammed the door and then to, to add insult to injury I had to go to work every day wake up 4 30 in the morning get on a train and guess what I saw on those big billboards on all the train stations they were advertising that movie um natural born killers. natural born killers when his big yeah. bald fucking head is staring at me every train stop and i'm like what did i do so now between that and you know not to get personal i was in a love triangle at the moment and my father was sick with cancer so like all this is happening to me at once the depression like the depression i had started like getting in me deep so thank goodness Within six months, something else happened. Yeah, and uh, and, and that go go ahead, go on. Well, I'm Please. rehearsing at Rockaway Studios, and when I say Rockaway, I mean Rockaway Beach, like the Ramon song, Rockaway Beach. For those who don't know, yes. there's a there was a place called Rockaway Studios that fucking whatever what was that uh, that hurricane that came through, which just Andy. destroyed it. Sandy destroyed it. Yep. Anyway, um, uh, the guy who worked behind the counter. His name was Mark Newman. Mark Newman was a guitar player of Sheer Terror. Now, Sheer Terror was a serious punk band, if you guys, whoever doesn't know, in New York, the singer being Paul Bearer. Yeah, one of Mark the great, Newman was in Sheer great Terror. Great front man, but, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Paul Bearer being one of the great front men in New York. You know, right. uh, So bullshitting with him, he said, listen, I've been recording with Marky Ramone, and we're going to put out this first record, but man, I, I did all my touring with Sheer Terror. I don't want to tour anymore. I'm just done touring. I think Marky would like you. He said, I want to introduce you. I'm like, really? I'm like, wow, okay. So it's like, I, I he introduced me to Marky. We liked each other. I played with him. Uh, Didi Ramon came down during, I guess if it was an audition, I don't know what it was. And we all got along. And and I don't know what Didi was doing there, but we all jammed. And it was like this great moment. And so uh, Marky Ramon said, the Ramones are going to retire for real because they kept oh, faking oh, oh, this retirement. Is, oh, this is before the Ramones even stopped playing? They didn't even retire. They officially retired in 96 doing the Lollapalooza thing. Wow. But um, yeah, this was still 95. So we wow. started rehearsing even before the, the Ramones even retired. He says, I got this original band and... and um, <clears throat> He wants to do more writing and stuff like that. So my picture is on the back of the first record, but mm -hmm. I didn't play on it. I uh, Mark Newman played bass and sang. Ah. I think he sang some shit on there too. Yeah. So when we went, as we were playing, as the years went by, I mean, my first gig with Marky, crazy as it was, the very beginning of uh, the end of '96, uh, we did this uh, festival called the Close Up Festival, and it was uh, in Brazil. And um, and I was in Sao is, Paulo. Is that the, is that the poster Rio. you sent me? Yeah, there was a flyer. I found. But before we get there, who else is in the band here? Who who's, who's so okay? So this was not this was not the incarnation of the band as it began. As it began, right. it was this guy named Skinny Bones. Well, who, well, well, Skinny Bones. I know, and I've known yeah. Skinny Bones a long time. Skinny Bones, I, I, and I have a little. It could be a different guy. No, you talk about Garrett Eulenbrock. Garrett, Garrett Uhlenbrock, yeah. Garrett Uhlenbrock is a kid I okay. grew up with. I no him, way. And, and, and Garrett produced Antidote. Um, I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, I have. Th th this is a, a very low res picture, but I can put yeah. it up. This is this is you guys. This is the band with Garrett in it. That's with Garrett. Yeah. Yeah, Garrett. That, uh -huh. Garrett, I've known uh, for, for for those for those that watch the show and know the show. Garrett, um, I knew f through Zum, uh, they went to boarding school together and uh, Garrett ended up producing Antidote at a certain point. G Garrett ended up being a, um, a sound engineer. He went to school and he co-wrote a couple of Ramon songs. Yes, and, uh, he wrote with, because Mar Marky didn't play guitar. So on right. the later Ramon's records that you know yeah. people in America didn't adhere to as much, Mondo right. Bizarro, there was a few of them uh garrett actually wrote guitar for barky's lyrics and i yeah. think he actually he might have written with I, I don't know don't quote me on this he might have written something with dd too skinny, I'm not, I'm not skinny sure. bones i know man skinny he's bones. Still, yo he still lives in woodstock 
Right. He's that's where he lives now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so so after a while of uh so okay, so that festival well, here you we go. did. This this is this Yeah, is there it is. So that festival this, was actually look at this lineup. The lineup was insane. This was yeah. now remember, I'm going from playing the bitter end with Crispy Brown, and this is my first like gig, real gig with marketing only intruders. It's twenty thousand people at a stadium. And we're on right before Cypress Hill, and so I and they were watching us play. And I just, I don't know. So I've seen mosh pits like you know we've all seen how many you know mosh pits yeah. and all. This was the biggest mosh pit I've ever seen, and it was for us. It was just this giant fucking pit, and it was insane. Let, let me and, ask you: when, when you did this early Mike and Ramon and Trudy stuff, did you guys yeah. play Ramon's songs? We did uh, a, a few. Couple? Yeah, it was mostly he wanted to push the originals, but yeah, we did more, you know, more obscure ones. We did Outsider. I don't oh, yeah, care. That's a good one. That's a good yeah, one. those are great, great songs. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And then after a while, later on, we would do like Sedated, and, and he would find a drummer in the audience, and then Marky would sing Sedated. <laughs> Marky can't sing. He's got like a monotone voice. It was just like, it was just fun and funny. Um, But yeah, that was insane because this wow. was my first bowed out. And actually, the guitar player... There was Rat Boy. If you remember Venus Records on St. Mark's, of course. There was a record store called Venus Records. Rat Boy worked at Venus Records, and he was the guitar player that went to um, to Brazil with us. But that was the is only this, time. What's because this one? Is this is this Russia? What is this? That is okay. So that's four years later. It's the year two thousand. Now Skinny Bones is not in the band anymore, and that other kid, Ben Trokin, who was the singer. He's not even in the band anymore. At this point, this is the third incarnation. Mm -hmm. And we were, um, we did 10 days in Moscow and St. Petersburg. 10 days? 10 days. We were there. We did a bunch of gigs in Moscow, took a train, a 10 hour train to St. Petersburg. And it never got dark because of that time of year. It was like this weird, like the sun barely went down. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was an incredible and, and, experience. And here's, here's one of you. Uh, back home, and I figured this one out. Uh, here's <laughs> you play, this is the Continental. Yeah, that's yeah, fucking trigger. I yep. ran into him recently in the street. He oh, just opened around. up a joint. I, I, yeah, yeah, I see him all the time. I see. Him he's the, the man. We got to go to his cafe. He just he just opened a new yeah. one up in uh, I think it's in Chinatown. I'm not sure the exact street. He's, he's a character. He's a fucking. You know, he's awesome. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, that was us. We used to play there, and then Didi would come and join us once in a while. He would jump on stage. Didi, Didi had a funny, man, Didi, he was, fuck, oh, man, I could say so much about him. There Listen. were like five, there were like five Didis, and three of them and were you, really nice. And you nice. never knew which one you were going to get. You don't know, no, no. <laughs> and he had, you know, he would have this way of talking, kind of like this. And he had said to Marky once, he goes, I don't know about that Johnny Paisano, he's too good. <laughs> like, he would say shit like that behind my back, but. When he saw me, he always hugged me. And what's going on? What's going on here? What he hurt himself? Uh, well, that was uh, yeah. We would play this. It was the museum of the Tommy Gun upstairs, and downstairs was a venue. It was in, I think it was in Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, and, Kentucky. Yeah, and, and yeah. backstage was this dark area. And Marky went to get on stage, and he fell. I, I, this picture sucks. That bruise, it's really red. Like it looks like the red is like this, this picture behind me, like, like really red, you know? Yeah. One of the injuries we, uh, we managed to get yeah, through. Uh, yeah. On the job. <laughs> on the job. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, another, yeah. So, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying, I'm just kind of like pushing through it. Because yeah, man. Rip through so, it. It's there's fine. So, there's so much to talk about. We could, we could spend the next half hour talking about Marky, but I will, yeah. I, I do, I do want to ask this. Why did it end? It seemed like you were in the band. You were in the band for almost five years. Why did yeah. your tenure with Marky come to well, an end? Well, after like again, Skinny Bones, whatever you know, not yeah. to, uh, not going to talk about why you know he, he couldn't be in the band anymore. And then Marky kind of said, "All right, we can't do that." And then uh, after a while, we became a three piece, and it was me, right. Marky, and Ben Troken. I think that was the best incarnation. Sure. Then Ben Troken didn't want to do it anymore after like 1999. So we got this guy, Alex Crank, who hmm. I get another guy who died, uh, fucking ALS, took him nine years to die. It sucks. Hmm. But um, 
So Marky really liked the uh, the band when it was with Ben. We sat, I think, and I think he's right. I think we sounded the tightest and sounded the best with Ben. And then uh, the, we were touring with the Misfits a lot. We would open up yeah, for them. Right. And right. Misfits gave him an offer like, listen, why don't you come on tour with us? And, you know, you don't have to play Misfits songs, but yeah. just come up and we'll play a bunch of Ramon songs with you. And he realized if I don't put out original music, I don't have to deal with the record company bullshit and, and merchandise and all. I don't have to deal with anything. If I just do Ramon's covers, I could make a living as a Ramon doing Ramon's covers. So he started doing that and he said, listen, I just want to dissolve Marky Ramon and the Intruders. We'll all be friends still. You know, it's all yes. good. And ironically, that was the year 2000. And luckily for me, while, I, while the Intruders were still happening, this guy named Jesse Mallon was doing right. was doing a, a band. He was doing like Jesse So S O L O Solo, and he had a band called Sing Sing, S uh, called T S I N G, like the prison. Right. And uh, he had a bass player named Jr. that he wasn't sure about. So <clears throat> when I was with Marky Ramone, uh, Rat Boy from Venus Records, he was doing a recording of uh, Johnny Thunder's covers, and we did Diary of a Lover. And the drummer for that was Joe Rizzo. Joe Rizzo was the last drummer for the D generation. So right. Joe Rizzo got in touch with me later on and said, uh, hey, I want to introduce you to this guy. He's looking for a bass player, Jesse Mallon. I said, oh, yeah, I never met him. I know him from D-Gen and you know, right. Coney Island High, the greatest fucking club, right? Of course. So it was, it was downstairs at Brownies, like in the basement. That used to be the dressing room when Brownies was Brownies, you know. And Joe introduced me to Jesse and, and, and I knew Marky was kind of fading out. So Marky and Jesse kind of, it was like Marky ended it and Jesse, it, I just got really lucky. So September of 2000, I started playing with Jesse Mallon. So and I got lucky when Marky ended, you know, uh, you know, I did get, I, did, I got lucky not to be bandless. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. a musician looking for a band is, a, you know, after he's been like, like Brian Stanley right now, the bass player of Garland Jeffries. He was with Garland Jeffries all these years. Now, all of a sudden, like, you know, he's looking for work. You know, I always try to help people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Find work that way. Um, so, so you joined Jesse. It was Bellevue at first. And then. Yeah, I it was guess... called Sing Sing, actually. Oh. And then. So, yeah, it was called Sing Sing. And then it, Sing Sing uh, actually went to L.A. And there was a TV show, I don't remember the name of it, with Katie Seagal. You know who that is, the actress uh, yeah, of course. She, married she with sang, children. She sang backup vocals with Bob Dylan. Exactly. Yes, fuck it. She's amazing. So she she had this TV show, or whatever, and the 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 kid in the TV show was a fan of Degeneration. Mm -hmm. And there were Degen posters, and we were allowed to put Sing Sing posters in the set. So when the TV camera went, mm -hmm. they would show, you know. But later on, Jesse's like, look, I want to change the name to Bellevue. And then we made a record as Bellevue and toured as Bellevue. We toured across mm. the country and it was me, Esco, if you know Esco Pelverdi, um, he's a great guitar player. I was just on the phone with him the other day talking about Jesse. Um, and uh, Joe Rizzo was on drums and uh, Joe McGinty on keyboard. Uh, and we, um, we toured as Bellevue. And then after a year of that, uh, Jesse said, listen, you know, I'm friends with Ryan Adams and Ryan wants to produce my next record and I'm looking to just change things up. Yeah, that's the record. Uh, I'm looking to change things up. I want to keep you as a bass player. I, I need I need a more of a jangly guitar player. But, you know, Ryan's going to play guitar on the record. And uh, he needed a drummer. And wow. um, <clears throat> so through Alex Crank, the last singer for Mark and the Intruders, this guy, Paul Garisto, was working for him uh, in this art delivery uh, company. Paul Garisto played with Iggy Pop. He played with Psychedelic First, right? Right. So I'm like, hey, Jesse, I got this guy. If you want. So Paul came down and auditioned, and immediately he's an amazing drummer. So he was in, and we recorded this record. And this now, the now magic. This, now, this, 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 this is the record that, that Ryan Adams produced. And yeah. this this was legit. This was on Ar this was Artemis Records, which was right. like like a, a real deal record label, right? You were you were, you you were on a real deal label. 
I yeah, I guess I, I think I, I felt, you know, it felt amazing. Just the whole thing, regardless, even, I, you know, record companies, whatever, like I just felt like I was part of this amazing, magical thing. And I knew it. And um, uh, we didn't know how how magical because later on, everybody keeps referring to this record. Yeah. Years later, yeah. Jesse has made tons of records and they're all great, in my opinion. Yeah. But they keep reverting back. To well, this, this, record. this, this, this record, this record. Yeah, it is yeah. Has, has aged well, and and he he comes back to a lot. He comes back to he comes back to it a lot. And and yeah. didn't you co-write TKO on this record? I did. I helped him. Well, we were. <laughs> you remember Giorgio's? Where yes. the, the late the, yeah. So we would rehearse at Giorgio's, and I remember being there, and he needed a bridge for TKO. So I I was playing around. I came up with the chords for right. the bridge. Got uh, it. Uh, to that, and then you know, and then I I um. Uh, you know, just came up with bass lines for like the song Subway, which mm -hmm. I played upright bass on that song. Mm -hmm. And uh, and yeah, just being in the studio. What well, I forget the name of that studio on Clinton Street. There was a studio. <clears throat> not Chung, not Chung King. No, no, that was. The... No, but um, we recorded it there. Platinum and, Island? Uh, no, no, fuck, I can't remember. Right. But, um, just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was great. It was just one of those moments where uh, I think Ryan... Ryan was dating an actress. I can't remember who. Uh, my, my, it escapes me right now. Mm -hmm. But there's so many great stories about recording that record. Well, and, it didn't, um, didn't uh, you know? And, and I think, and I think we'd be amiss to not touch on this. Um, isn't this the first time that you worked with this guy? I, 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 I. <laughs> isn't, isn't it is didn't this guy come across your radar screen at this point oh uh at one point i guess well jesse would do light a day light a day is a parkinson's disease benefit yeah in us uh, in, in south uh, asbury park right. and uh and you know springsteen is obviously a supporter a friend of bob benjamin who founded it so sure. when we would play springsteen would come on stage and play with us play right. play a jesse mallon song with us now that I'm with Willie Nile, he comes on and plays a Willie Nile song with us. So I don't right. play Springsteen songs with Springsteen. Right. Springsteen plays our songs with us. That's and, pretty cool. He's a great guitar player. People don't really, he's not just an amazing songwriter. He, yeah. he's, he's got great fingers. Yeah. So at, at that time, yeah, he was around. But uh, I, I know this isn't a real old shot, but this is a great shot. Yeah. Oh, man. You know? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Of, that's Alex on drums, Alex Alexander. So that was what. Uh, and is that Bruce Juice playing that Telecaster of his? Yeah, he had. A, he's got Kevin. His guitar tech is right on the side with like an arsenal of guitars, whatever he wanted. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but that's the Telly. Yeah. But but Spring, telly. Springsteen's on that Jesse album, um, right? Broken he, Radio. He's on. I think. Right. He's on a later. He's on a later record. It's not ah. on Fine Art. It's on a few records later. It, it came out as a single, actually. Oh 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 oh. Yeah. Um, right. Got yeah, it. and Jesse had me go and play bass on that too. But Jesse had a lot of people playing in and out, so I'm not sure what wound up making it to the final final. You know. Right. But uh, yeah, that's yeah. a great song. All the all those songs. Jesse's an amazing New York songwriter. All his lyrics are are so New York. I, I don't know if a lot of people that are not from here realize that yeah. where the songs come from. And even if they don't sound punk rock, like I said earlier, it's all from a punk rock state of mind. You know, here's another shot of you and Bruce juice. Um, Bruce juice. Bruce juice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody got to go. So, Bruce yeah, my, that, yeah. My chin just doesn't do that. I don't know how he does that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he does that thing, you know, he's born like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, he's that, a good guy. He would come backstage with us and hang out and like say, hey, so what are we playing? So I'd be like, oh, you know, we got this easy song, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we would hang out backstage. He'd learn the song quick, bullshit a while, and then we'd see him on stage. He's a great dude. He's he's the guy you want Bruce to be. Like, you know, you're afraid to meet your heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, no, he is I, amazing. He's a sweet that, guy, just a down to earth guy, man. The, and that, no, I, okay, I, that I, picture. I know, I know, I know this is, I know what we're going out of, out of sequence here. And I know this yeah, that's is fine. later. But is is this the 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 uh, the same uh, yearly um, benefit down on the shore? Yeah. But this 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 is Mike from the Alarm, and this is yeah. this is your pal, and 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 
and boss bandmate for for many years now willie nile on the left right that is my brother in arms yeah he uh yeah. this is yeah willie nile who i've been playing with since yeah. 2006 actually yep. uh we've been together a long time um talk about amazing front men amazing songwriters i've been so lucky to have these amazing front men in my life um uh, to back up, to support, you know, yeah. my job as a bass player, you know, yeah, <laughs> to sure. support these, these front men. And Mike Peters was there that year and he, he came on stage with us. That was a magical moment. Uh, we were playing one guitar, Willie's song, one guitar, which, uh, Mike Peters actually recorded and put it as a single on mm. one of his records. Wow. And one guitar was being covered by a bunch of people back then. Even I covered, I did a reggae version. And yeah. I put it on my record. Actually, I, yeah. I I heard it a couple of times while I was yeah, uh, yeah. while I was doing my homework. Here, here's yeah. here's here's another shot of uh, of of that lineup. Um, a black and white shot. Here you go. Yeah, that was a that was a magical night, man. That was just yeah. amazing. I love Mike Peters. I love the Alarm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because I'm such a like I'm such a big Alarm fan. Again, like I I've, I've been in Mike Peters' house with his wife and kids. Because uh, I was touring with Willie Nile in the UK, and Mike Peters contacted me and said, "Hey, why don't you take a train? Because we were in uh, near London, outside of London. Take a train to Wales, man. I want you to play on my record. I'm doing sh the, the album Strength, but I'm doing an updated version of different versions." And I'm like, "Yeah, I was, we we had a couple of days off, Willie, and I was like, I'm going to take off for a few days." took a train. He's got this church. It's a beautiful old church where he has all his merchandise and upstairs wow. it's like a studio. Wow. So I, I, yeah, I recorded all these tracks and he released this record, uh, strength 2015. It was called. Right. It's, it's sort called, of, yeah. it's sort of a, uh, a, an updated version. Yeah. Just like odd versions, like cool, yeah. obscure versions of these songs that yeah. I, we all grew up loving, sure. you know? And, yeah. Just, he's an amazing guy and he's so cool. Uh, I, I, yeah, the, the shit he's gone through, and he's still like yeah. pounding through it with cancer, yeah, and then his you, wife. You know, um, I crossed paths with him a couple years ago because the film that he did, sort of the the documentary, yeah. uh, is yeah. was distributed by the same distributor that 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 uh, that did my film and put it on. No the, shit. So we ended up crossing paths. Oh, uh, that's we awesome. Have the same, we have the same distributor, and. Yeah. Uh, Man in a man in a camo jacket. I think. Yeah, it's I, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Amazing yeah. film. And his wife, after that film, she wound up getting cancer. That's right. And and you know who yeah. Mike is close with is Stephen Messina, who who yes, is, yeah, he he's pals My boy. with Stephen. He's he's pals with Stephen Messina. Yeah, in, Stephen's awesome. Yeah, interesting. Interestingly enough, he's um, a good guy right there, Stephen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man. So you want to you want to hear a quick story about the UK before? So sure. keep in mind what you're about to sure. say because sure, sure, sure. I probably Go shouldn't ahead. even say this because Jimmy's Gestapo is going to be calling me and wanting to track somebody down for for to do something not nice because anyway, there's no way I know how to find these guys. However, last time we were in the UK was a year ago, right? I, I'm in a situation where these guys uh, um, um, and they're like, "Listen, we're DJs," and um, you know. We got successful because Christina Aguilera allowed us to mix one of her songs. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, yeah, Willie, we're like, yeah, great for your success. They were friends of a friend, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. They said, yeah, name's Murphy's Law. I'm like, your name's what? They were like, yeah, the name, our our name is Murphy's Law. And right. I'm like, no, dude, that's a name of a that's a name of a famous hardcore band in New York. They go, you know that band? I'm like. Yeah, I'm like good friends with the singer, you know. Oh, well, let me tell you, we've been getting death threats from not from him, but from his fans. You gotta <laughs> change your fucking name. We're gonna come and kill you. All this shit, and I'm cracking up laughing. And oh I'm like, God. oh, I know Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy will hunt you down. I said, he said, well, the thing about Murphy's Law is our last name is Murphy. I was like, oh, I'm like. 
you know, you might get a pass on that one. <laughs> you, might said, <laughs> you might, you might, I don't know. So he said, well, we actually added to our name. It's called like Murphy's Law Music. I don't know. They put a, an extra word. It's in like, there. we're, we're not Murphy's, you we're know. Murphy's Law UK. Right. <laughs> Something like that. That's exactly, that's what they did. But I had to, I had to make sure I told you that because we're that's buddies, funny. you know, we, that, we know funny. Jimmy. And now yeah. I know my fucking phone is going to blow up. Jimmy's going to fucking call me right now and go, hey, give me those fucking guys. How do I find those guys? <laughs> they're, they're fucking dead. <laughs> so, so um, you know, kind of pushing it forward because I got to take a break, sponsor yeah, break. Sure. And then I want to come back. And I really want to talk about the acting stuff with you and bring, and bring sure, Robbie sure. on. But before we, before we do and I also want to say to people that are watching the show, I know there's a couple people out there that are watching the show maybe for the first time. The last part of the show, we take questions from around the world. So I, I know people are asking, uh, uh, putting up a couple questions in the chat room, this and that. Tell us about this. There's going to be an opportunity at the end where you can repost, and we're going to do like 10, 15 minutes of, you know, of freestyle questions. So ho hold on, hold on Great. to that stuff. So I will let, fail let's, all those questions. Yeah. <laughs> so let, let, let's let's um, let, let's talk about um, Willie Nile, and yeah. you, you you you've been playing with Willie, like since 2007, uh, yeah. you, you're like, my perception of his, like, uh, 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 of it, you're like his guy, you know, you're, you're, you're solid, you're solid. He can count on you. You've been in the band, you know, uh, another, an, an, another old friend of mine plays drums, John Weber. Uh, Weber. How did the, how, how did the Willie Nile thing come to play and give us some perspective on your tenure with Willie Nile? Well, well um, to make a long story longer. So, I owe, I owe my entire life, which sometimes I wake up cursing him once in a while, yeah. Mark Newman, right? right? It started with Mark Newman introducing me to Marky, going to Jesse. Well, in 2006, Willie Nile, because even though I stopped, play, I stopped playing with Jesse in 2005. Right. Even after I stopped playing with that guy, Jesse wound up getting me gigs with other people. I played on Ryan Adams records because of him. Deborah Harry because of him. I could go on and on at mm -hmm. the stuff mm -hmm. Jesse, I owe a lot to Jesse Mallon. So yep. Willie Nile goes up to Jesse Mallon and says, hey, you know, I'm looking for a bass player. Do you know anybody? And Willie said, without batting an eye, he's like, Johnny Paisano, here you go. He does his homework. He's a good guy. He's always on time. He'll show up and he'll, he'll, he'll you know, he'll do great for you. He's not and a clown. <laughs> not a clown, not a fucking clown. <laughs> right. So, uh, it's really because of Jesse. And then Willie contacted me and said, um, uh, Hey, you know, I'm looking for a bass player, whatever. And I said, Hey, I remember we didn't meet, but I did this show because of Jesse. Mm. I was, I played, uh, a Katrina benefit mm. at Irving Plaza. And my, the first band I played with, I was in Johnny lives with John Weber as the drummer. Right. And the last band of the night was Deborah Harry. Wow. So I played with fucking it was DJ. It was Mike Wildwood on drums. It was Danny Sage on guitar. It was sure. uh, Joe, Joe, Joe McGinty on piano and um, and, and Deborah Harry and me. And we right. did some some Blondie songs and we did some Ramon songs. Was this, was this so, at the Barry Ballroom? No, this was at Irving. At Irving. Packed Irving. Right, right, so right. that night, another magical night. So like later on, I, and I remember that night, there was this dude, you know, Willie Nile. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is, but he looks and sounds a little like Dylan, you know, but I like whatever song he was playing. I thought it was a good song. It was one of them being House of a Thousand Guitars. So I reminded Willie of that moment. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry we didn't get to meet that night, but I got this gig opening up for the Goo Goo Dolls and the Counting Crows at the PNC Art Center. And I'm like, what? Like another, like, boom. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. So I met him. We got along great. We, we, we had um, uh, his drummer, Frankie. There was a bunch of guys in the band, uh, including, um, what's his name from the Dell Lords? Was on oh, guitar. Scott? Scott was on, yeah. Scott, you know, another guy. I hope he's doing okay now. You know, yeah, wherever he is. Used to fucking we lost so many. Used to fucking, yeah. the Dell Lords were great in their yeah. heyday. The fucking Dell Lords were great. Yeah, wherever they are, these guys. I hope they're. I hope they're yeah. looking down upon us. And yeah. anyway, so um, uh, yeah. So we played this gig, and a funny thing was, here we are. Like, I I happened to like listen to his songs, and I picked up the bass, and I was fooling around. I'm like, I kind of learned some of his songs early because I didn't have anything going on at the time. Mm 
So now it's a few months, be, it's like a month before the gig and we're doing another Katrina benefit in this small pub in, 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 uh, in Brooklyn. And, right. and my, my buddy, Kira Caverno, the photographer, she's putting on the show and Willie's going to play with his bass player. Right? So I was stage managing that night. I volunteered to get the bands on and off on time. So Willie shows up uh, with, uh, what's his name? Uh, on guitar. Ah, I hate when my brain does this. Um, Jimmy Vivino on guitar for Conan O'Brien band, you know, of course. When, yeah. And, um, so he shows up with Vivino and Rich Pagano on right for the drummer. And he goes, oh, I'm waiting for my bass player. I'm like, listen, you know, I, I'm the stage manager. I said, I, I kind of got to get you on. Maybe we could skip something, you know, you go on after or whatever. He goes, Oh, my bass player just called. He showed up at the wrong venue. He wound up showing up at, at a venue in, in, in Williamsburg. He'll never get here on time. I said, look, I kind of know some of your songs because I started learning them for the gig we got to do next month. He goes, really? I'm like, yeah. He goes, all right, fuck it. I said, all right, I got to borrow a bass from the other band. So I think I borrowed a bass from Arlen Phyllis was playing that night. I, I love a bass it. From all night. right, fuck it. Right? So I fuck it. So I grab it. And these guys don't know me from Adam. Rich is probably like, this guy's going to suck. This is going to suck. Right, How right. I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not patting myself, but I killed it. Like nice. I wound up like remembering the songs that I, you know, and then whatever other oh, songs yeah, he had awesome. was easy. I killed it. And he was like, holy shit, this is great. You know, obviously we, I can't wait to do that. And then we wound up a month later doing the PNC art center with the Goo Goo Dolls and, and County Crows. And then there were a couple of more gigs that year. And then 2008, there were a couple more. And in 2008, we went to Holland and then to that, then it wound up, we used to do over a hundred gigs a year. We were going to Italy and Spain and the UK and, and, um, Canada. And, you know, now the gig got a little less, you know, these days after the pandemic, you know, I, I, Willie's I, 75 years old. I just, I just, I just want to, I want to interject also that, you know, Willie now, uh, well, Willie Niles, the kind of artist that people that love him, love him. Yeah. Like he's got, he's like one of those kind of cats from back in the day you know we don't need to get into the particulars like he was almost there yep. you know it, it's yeah. like but those that love him fucking love yeah. and 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 really support him as a, you know love he, I'll that tell you, guy. he had a great career going in the 80s and yeah. then his his manager screwed him up and he just quit yeah. the music business and then when he went to go back into it you know he couldn't get signed or whatever but he kept yeah, making he, 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 he that's what he it was, is he was like positioned to, he was like yeah. right there, right there. Yeah. And he was on the radio. Bad, couple, you couple remember a couple of bad breaks, bad management, bad right. labels, like that exactly. kind of bullshit, you know? You remember, uh, uh, yeah, that he was on the radio stations back then that we yeah. would listen to, you well, know, one or two especially, especially here on the East, Upper East Coast, you know, in right. the Northeast. This was his yeah. spot, man, you know? Right. And he yeah. has a way of, his songwriting's impeccable. He writes anthems, but it's yeah. not just that. I, I noticed like he could write a song. There's a song he wrote called Cell Phones Ringing in the Pockets of the Dead. And I use this example wow. because it's literally about the Madrid train bombing in 2003. Hmm. There was cell, like, there's a body bags laying all over the train tracks, right? And there were cell phones ringing in the body bags. Like just oh, wow. think about that for a minute. These wow. people trying to reach out to their loved ones and it's so fucked up. That's horrible. And he's... He has a way of singing a song like that and still kind of making people in the audience feel good. Wow. He's got this good, feel good kind of way about being right. a front man and still getting his point across and still coming off as, you know, I think he actually really believes his, his own when he when he says, I want the world to be a better place. Like he really, you know, he believes well, it. I, 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 I always, when I think of Willie Nile, I, I think of that same pool of like Bruce Springsteen, Jesse Mallon, Willie Nile, like, you know, that same yeah. sort of, you know, they're from, they're, they're all uh, interconnected and, and, uh, yeah. and, and somewhat similar, you know? Well, great, we got, he, yeah. he ended up, he ended up, uh, when he did have a record company, he wound up touring with the who across yes. America. Well, he opened, that, up, he opened up, he opened up stadium shows, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Back then. This is what I'm going no, 80. I'm like, I'm 12 years old going on 13. Yeah, no, right? no, he, so what do no, I know? He, but he did that when I was 12. <laughs> he, he opened yeah. up. For the who, I think it's some of those fucking big stadium shows in 1980. Yeah. 
1980. So now fast forward to a few years ago, he stayed friends with those guys. He we played with the who. the who. He played yeah, with the Who a couple years ago. We opened up for the Who at Bethel Woods at the, the site of Woodstock. Which How dude, is that? that? How is that? It's amazing. You know, I don't know if you know, like they, they, a lot of these bands will give the opening band half the PA, half the lighting, you know, you know, just, just the way it is. So when the, the real band comes on, it sounds like the Who gave us everything. The full lighting, the full PA. We were on the jumbotrons, yeah. and I'm like, when we opened up for the County Crows and the Google Dolls back when, you know, this, there wasn't that many people there. I mean, it was probably it was a five thousand seat. There was probably a thousand people there, but it was so spread out, it didn't yeah. look like much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was still a thousand people. I'm like, ah, who knows who will be there? Opening band. We came out, and there were it was a sixteen thousand, you know, seat place that yeah, yeah, yeah. was. There were eleven thousand people there, and oh. as we played. 2,000 more showed up. It was like, I just couldn't even believe it. And we, we you. killed it. We played really great. And I got to, I got to meet, uh, you know, Pete Townsend and I said hello to Roger. Wow. You know, it was just, yeah, it was an amazing. And is it, isn't Zach amazing. playing, Zach play Zach Starkley plays drums for them. Yes. He plays drums. Yeah. And he was doing a lot of, you know, he was doing a lot of, a lot of the, the, all the fills and stuff. He, he was killing it. Yeah. He's a great well, drummer. Yeah, and that's a picture of me when I, I when I guess I got to get back in the gym. <laughs> I need to get back in the gym. That's a good picture. Hey, let's yeah, yeah. Um, let me do this. Let me take a sponsor break. Yeah, and, man. And uh, we'll come back. And uh, we'll, I want to talk about the acting stuff. And and Great. there's there's lots to talk. About. I want to bring Robbie on and talk about what we have going on. So we'll we'll uh, give me a couple minutes. We'll be right yeah, back. Man. Kill okay. it. Okay. Here we go. It's the New York Hawkeye Chronicles Live. Our guest today, Johnny Paisano, lots to talk about. We're going to get into the acting stuff after these. In the area music scene, today they offer a diverse. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues soundtrack and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey! Guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do, and we are happy to see you guys. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Oh, shit. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes. Magic the Gathering, Warhammer, video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. Star Wars. We are New York hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it on. Damn straight. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. What's happening? We're back. We're going to go a little, I wouldn't say we go late, but we're definitely not wrapping this one up in a half hour. I'll tell you that. Um, a couple of reminders. Hey, first off, listen, please support the show. This show needs your support. Um, there's a Patreon page, um, $2 tier or $5 tier, different incentives. Please just, you know, I, support the show. What do you want me to tell you? 
think I want to be uh, you think you think you think I want to be on here hawking my wares support the show support the show that supports you uh there's a patreon page all kinds of stuff going on uh, um uh, special content uh, the book is for free a couple other stuff I think we're gonna make the incendiary device record free for uh for all patrons as well I, I gotta sort that out there's a PayPal address there if you want to make a contribution there's a super chat function when we do when we do questions uh, in a bit with Johnny Paisano. There's a super chat function. Uh, you could do it for a couple bucks. It comes through in color. I can't miss it. You go right to the right to the front of the line. Also, I want to mention. Um, I'm sure you're on Instagram. Follow the show on Instagram at Stone Films NYC. It seems like I am right at the cusp of uh, 10,000 followers. I'd like to get over that hump. So. If you're not following the show, please pick up your communication device at Stone Films NYC. Let's talk about a couple of upcoming shows. What's going on? Um, a week from today, there um, there is no show on Sunday because I will be in Greenville, South Carolina, screening my new film, The Jews and the Blues. Um, at the Greenville Jewish Film Festival. I'm told there's 250 tickets sold for this thing already. So I'm excited about that and I'm grateful for that. Um, that's that's on Saturday. Uh, actually, the screening's on Sunday. So there's no show on Sunday. We're back here a week from today with Kevin Sharp from Brutal Truth. A couple days after that is the new music spotlight. We're gonna bring on, we're gonna, we're gonna march a whole bunch of people through to talk about their new projects. Sunday, September 17th, by popular demand, the return of the lunatic, Jack Grisham. I'm real excited about this. Uh, Ignore Heroes, uh, The True Sounds of Liberty, his new film is fantastic. Reverend Tony Six of Winter Wolf is Saturday, September 24th. Shane Embry talking about his autobiography of Na uh, Napalm Death, October 1st. Ill Bill, co-hosted by Howie Abrams on October 4th and Trevor Moment of American Werewolves out of Cleveland on Sunday, October 15th. That said, um, that's right, communication device, activate and soldier up. Stone Films NYC, there you go. Um, Drew, your, rec your, your record release, I'm in any, yeah, there's gonna be stickers, they're making them now. I'm gonna show you the cover pretty soon. Things are moving forward with the record and all that. Uh, I want to bring on, you know what, where is, you know what I want to do first? Before we bring on um, someone that's going to make a return to the show, I want to show uh, a, a promo. Actually, here we go. Yeah, this is going on. Uh, then we got the the um, September 3rd show with Barry Electric with School Drugs. Dick Dynamite is coming to New York. I'm hosting the American premiere of the Dick Dynamite film, and here is the trailer. The cult classic indie movie that's taking the world by storm finally gets its USA debut. Stone Films NYC and the New York Hardcore Podcast proudly presents Dick Dynamite 1944. Featuring members of the Exploit, Biohazard, Dustin Frost, Sleeper Mod, and many more. Vinny Stigma, and Mike Gallo, Blog Dahlia, Lars Fredrickson, Lottie Bucket, Billy Grazia Day, Nick Oliveri, Dick Valentine, as Commander Eagles Kearney, Joey Z, and many more. Including a Q&A with director Robbie Steve Davidson, as well as special cast member guests. For one night only at the Nighthawk Cinema in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York. You'll explode when you see Dick Dynamite. That's right. Dick Dynamite, screening in New York. Uh, tickets are on sale now. Uh, this is going to be a great Fun night. Vinny Stigma is uh, is going to be part of the Q and A. Uh, come on down. Tickets are available now. I want to bring on the director of Dick Dynamite, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, of course, you may know him from playing guitar in the Exploited. Uh, played with Billy Bio, Robbie Steed Davidson. Hey, man. Hey, Drew. What's up? 
How's things? Yeah, yeah. Good. How's, good to be back. How's on. things in Scotland, buddy? Um, I'm wearing shorts. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> are you Are you excited about coming to New York? Oh, fuck yeah! It's It's going to be so cool. It's been a long time since I've been in New York. Um, and in fact, the I mean, I played there a bunch with Exploited, but the last time I was there was a stopover. Um, mm. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Movie looks nuts. It is. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been in New York. Hey, what's going on? And um, last time, I actually wanted to go to a, a guitar shop that was like one block behind CBGB's. I owe them money. But last I looked into it, uh, I think they're closed down. It was like on a first floor, the guitar the guitar store. What um, was the name of it? You remember? I, I can't remember what it was. I, I We just got into town first show of the tour and my guitar was all busted up from the flight <laughs> and i went into the guitar shop and i was like i was a young kid and no money uh, respect the scotland yeah so yeah and i said to them i was like look I'm, I'm just just off the plane my guitar's busted up i have no money and the guy was like forget about it and you know i thought that meant all right cool i'm you you know just this little punk kid uh and i feel ashamed for you i'm going to fix it you know when our tour manager was there with me and i was like oh it's cool so he he left to go do his job and and then 20 minutes later, the guy comes back out. He's like, all right, that's 27 bucks plus tax. And I was like, but you said forget about it. I thought that means like you, you took pity on me and you're doing it for free. Yeah, and, yeah. and I had like zero money or maybe like <laughs> maybe funny. like a couple of dollars in change. And that's like the funny. guy's face, like I, I felt so bad. And I've always wanted to return and be like, here's your 27 bucks. Um, but from what I gather, it's not there anymore, which is a shame. Okay. Maybe I can track down the owner and be like, right. hey. <laughs> if you remember the name of the place, let me know. Yeah. You know, that that said, uh, let's bring on Johnny Paisano. Hey, buddy. What's up? Hey, guys. Hey, man. How you doing? Hey, yeah. how's it going, Johnny? Good. Scotland, one of my favorite places, man. Oh, cool. You've been? Yeah. Oh, played in Largs and like some off places like that. Largs? <laughs> yeah. Played in Largs? <laughs> Fucking Largs is a yeah, kick ass town, man. It's a tough yeah. people. Is that yeah, if there's a war, you guys, you guys are the guys that I want behind me. I'll tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, Scotland's you were, got you were, tough you were motherfuckers, about, bro. You were talking <laughs> about tough guy bands earlier, like Echo and the Bucky uh, Bunny Man. Yeah, yeah, right. Did you, yeah, you hear yeah. that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I, I didn't have any run-ins with them, but, uh, <laughs> but like Exploited had run-ins with so many people, and and yeah. uh, that ended up pretty gnarly. A lot of the time. Hey, hey, jo Johnny Robbie was in the exploited on and off for, for, for many years. So he's he's used to chaos. Chaos is my <laughs> life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big so, style. Yeah. So Robbie's a fellow filmmaker. Um, I haven't talked about it much on the show, but you know, uh I will eventually he's involved in a new project uh in my dramatic film that's in development called Find His Keepers. He's coming here, we're doing some actor, we're doing some um some script reads with actors. We're doing some location scouting, and we're screening his film, uh, Dick Dynamite. So I thought, nice. I thought, I thought it would be cool to to have Robbie with us a little bit. Uh, let's talk about the acting thing, Johnny. And uh, how did you get into it? And and sort of, you know, you, I, and you've done a lot. You've done a lot of stuff. So t t tell us about like how did the acting thing come into oh. into into view for you? Well, uh, after after Jesse, like 2005, somewhere in there, I, I got in this band, uh, Musician Sans Frontiers, this weird kind of band. And there was a, f uh, a female violinist. I don't know if you know her from New York, Susan Mitchell. And we toured in uh, Hungary and Bucharest and in Romania, the weird places. And she said, I'm, a, I'm an extra in films and I do it with my violin. If you have an upright bass, which I did at home, uh, maybe you could do it in films just as a background guy. I'm like, right. yeah. So I wound up doing that. And, and my, my, uh, my first gig was pretending to, you know, fake playing as uh -huh. a background guy. And I'm like, she said, if, you know, when music as a New Yorker, you know, you can't survive as just being a musician. We're always hustling and doing how many different jobs, right? Sure. It's just what we do. So I was, that's what I was doing other than playing music. That was my other job. I was an extra in films. Well, so, as so, I was doing, mm -hmm. yeah, keep going. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I want to ask you about, about mm -hmm. being an, an extra in films. And um, I have I have a bunch of a bunch of cool stuff like like um, I, I don't, 
j- just so we have a reference and we yeah. you don't have to go right there but here here's you uh, on the sopranos right yeah. <laughs> and uh that's when uh silvio got shot in the parking lot of the bada bing that was like the second to last episode of the whole the whole sopranos yeah yeah right and here's you know here now now i don't know if this <clears throat> this this is this extra work isn't this a little more than extra work here you are in law and order right know? well there's there's extra work and then there's something called featured extra where back okay. in the day they used to pay you extra for doing that, but they, you know, they got cheap and they don't do that. But um, yeah, they're more so, like. So, you, so my you, question is, so, so, so my perception is like there's like a whole like like is there a whole community around the extra thing? I think there would be right that like this is like we're like you're doing a film like let's yeah. call it, like is there like a whole crew that's like we're the extras this is what we do we know how to behave we know what we're doing could you tell us about yeah. that well not everybody knows how to behave and that's part of the problem yeah, that's you know right. someone's no. get, uh, yeah he's nodding his head like you know yeah he's, you he's got the director these, uh, he knows yeah like you, you know these you you really have to know how to keep your mouth shut and and and, and let the, the 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 crew do their work because if you're bullshitting and, and you know where they're trying to concentrate or if an actor is trying to remember their lines you can't be staring like if Denzel. I could be in a room with Den. I have been in a room with Denzel Washington, you know, when he's standing there and he's trying to remember something. You can't be like trying to get a picture with him, or just, yeah. you got to just be like Joe Cool. You're supposed to be their equal, which is bullshit, you know. Unless Adam Sandler's on set, he's cool. He'll come and talk to you and everything. But you even got to give him. You got to give the director and the DP and everyone. You got to give them space to do their work. If for no reason at all, just to get the work going, to get the day over with, so everybody could go home. You're right. there for one day as an extra, basically, right. unless you know, unless they need you for multiple days. These guys are working 15 hour days, and a lot of people don't realize that. And you, when, a lot of these, you know, non union actors, they're trying to learn and figure out how it works. And then there's a lot of union actors that are just oblivious, and maybe they don't need the money, and they're just there because they're bored. But, you know, I did it and I respect the job and I respect it. And especially after a while, I became a stand-in. A stand-in right. is basically a cardboard cutout that moves on its own. And they, they want you to watch, you know, you'll stop me if I'm wrong. The, 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 the director more or less steps away and the DP wants you to watch the, the actor rehearse. And he wants you to mimic whatever the actor did. Most of the time you just stand there so they could get the lighting. But sometimes if the actor made a move, like he goes, oh, on the third line, he went like this and he reached, oh, st- can you do that move? He reached for the glass. Can you stay? So I literally have to stand there like this while they get the lighting. Right, there might right. be a shadow on my arm that they got to get rid of. Right. So as a stand-in is a much more responsible part of the role and you're not in the film, but you're a part of the crew. I actually preferred being a stand-in yeah. than to be a blur in the background. But yeah. sometimes, like you saw, sometimes they bring the background into the foreground. And, and uh, sometimes... Like uh, there was a there's a uh, film called uh, uh, Royal Pains. It was about this guy, you know, a TV show in New York, of uh, uh, rich doctors in, in the Hamptons. Well, this girl hit her head in the episode and she was seeing morphed out faces. And these guys looked in the mirror and she asked her, what do you see when you see our faces? And she says, I don't know. You both have the same face. Well, they got my face and they CGI'd it on both their faces. So I thought that was one of the funnest things I did because wow. I was I was in and out in a few hours and I got to see what they did. I was like part of a CGI. I was so proud of that. Another one I was like featured as a garbage man in the film The Delivery Man. And and now, I'm, I, have, throwing, I, have a, I have a shot of that. And I yeah. wasn't sure I, I, I was I wasn't sure what this is. Right. So the film, The Delivery Man, Vince Vaughn, he had he's a sperm donor. He had 600 kids or whatever, and he's going through it. And he wanted to go legit, so he got rid of his weed. He threw all his weed out. Well, those are the garbage bags with the weed sticking out. And that's me. <laughs> Instead of throwing the garbage into the back of the garbage truck, I'm taking it to the front. So I, I went see. and saw this film in the theater. And, and to tell you the truth, that was one of the only scenes that really got a laugh was when they saw me taking it to the front of the truck. So there's been some fun moments and other times I'm just a blur in the back. It's just a day's pay. And what I wound up doing later on was I got into this other clique of people who buy old cars for films. So now I'm making money for the car as a prop. I bought an old caddy from 1989. So if they're filming something in the eighties and nineties, they'll call me and the other car people 
and we'll make money from the car and as an extra. So once I started doing that, I really just don't want to go back, you know, unless they need me to play bass in films. Yeah. That wasn't my car, but I had right. another well, I, I, my I, I old thought, car. I thought it was, it's, some, it's somewhat of an example, yeah. right? Yeah, they dressed me up as, you know, I don't know what I look like, like uh, Sonny Bono. And uh, and the funny part is, look at the name of the store. Yeah. It's almost my name. It's, 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 <laughs> but, but this is, and, and, and I'm knowing this, this is, this is probably from classic cars or whatever. They have, they. Uh, yeah, that's one of the businesses, yeah. yeah. You, you usually, and, and I've known people that have worked for these companies. I almost worked right. for one uh, many years ago. You have right. a main, you have a main guy that owns like you know 20, 30 of these cars. But yeah. no matter what you need, he can pick up the phone and get you anything, anything, bro. Because Fucking Lamborghini, just, anything, yeah, yeah, anything, anything. So I just, I own one car. I, you know, I only have yeah. one garage. And that, what that picture you saw, that was a film called God's Pocket with uh, right. Philip Seymour Hoffman. On it, his last film before he died, actually. I want to I want to ask you that. about a, a, a few things uh, specifically, because um, recently we did a Martin Scorsese uh, retrospective, and yeah. I saw that you were in one of my favorite Scorsese films. There you are in the background. <laughs> there uh, you were in yeah. Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. So I had my my, my neighbor that my neighbor had an '80s car, so I borrowed the '80s car for that. But then they said, "Listen, just park the car in the parking lot. We'll use it later." We need you in the scene. So that's the scene in Wolf of Wall Street when he was working for the low, the, the penny yeah. Uh, broker. Yeah, sure. when he made his first big sale, I was sitting behind him when the camera hit. You know, it's like if you blink, you miss these scenes. This is just like a moment, you know, you know, it's just how they edit it. And I but, just happened to but, get. But that said, that said, there, there's like for me personally, there, like to be on a set with Martin Scorsese. And Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio, who I fucking, he's, he's one of my favorite amazing, actors. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, just to be, you're sitting there yeah. you're, you're comfortably. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, you see, okay, so this, let me tell you about this scene. It's crazy. This made the newspaper. Uh, the paparazzi was there. I'm in that car at the bottom, right? That's the 80s car. So Scorsese, I could hear him in the distance. You know, he's got that voice. He kind of talks like this. So I'm driving the car and, and Leonardo's crossing the street. It's the first day of filming Wolf of Wall Street. And we're on Wall Street. You know, it's a Sunday morning, whatever. <clears throat> so I drive and he crosses. Okay. I could hear, yeah, tell that guy to go faster. So the PA tells me, hey, can you drive a little faster? I said, yeah, no problem. Drive a little faster. He goes, ah, I'm not seeing the guy. Tell, tell him to drive a little faster. So I drive a little faster. I'm like, look, I, this is what I do. I said, I get right on his fucking heels. I this is what I do anyway when people are crossing the street. Like, come on, get out of the way, right? Right, right. So now I, this 80s car I got, the brakes don't always work great, you know? So he's crossing. He's, we're doing the cross. Take two, take three. He's, he's, if you see, he's holding a briefcase. Well, that briefcase is a prop. One, so one of the takes, as he's crossing the street, as I'm going, you know, 10 miles an hour, eight miles. I'm not going fast. Yeah, yeah. But the handle of the briefcase breaks. So... Hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. My, uh, my ear fence went out. So, oh, right. so the handle. Oh, now you're echoing. Huh? It's all right. All right. So yeah. So the handle of the briefcase breaks and he turns around and goes like this. Meanwhile, I'm coming at you. I had a slam on my brakes. I almost hit him. If I hit him, I would have halted an $80 million budget film. I would have broke his leg or something. It would have been bad. Well, that's just one of those crazy moments, you know, where they should have used a stunt driver, but sometimes production is so stupid and cheap and they, they, you know, they didn't use a stunt driver. They used me and they should have paid me at least for a, not for stunt, maybe for precision driving, whatever. But that's a, a, another, you said the world of background people, the yeah. world of background people, this is, these are the things we discuss. And it's part of the reason why the writers are on strike because sometimes these, the production just doesn't do the right thing. You know, people don't do the right thing. Well, this I is, know, you know, it, 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 go ahead, Robbie, you were saying? The the extras thing, I don't know if it's a, a UK thing, right, uh, for Johnny here, but for the likes of, we, we did this on, on Dynamite, when you got extras in the background in a bar and something, they may not look like they're having a conversation, but they're not. They've got to be quiet if you're recording audio, right? So uh, there, this trick from this famous TV show here called EastEnders, where the extras would be asked to mutter or mime the words cucumber or rhubarb and right. i just wondered, 
I just wondered if that was an American thing as well. You know, you've got these people in the background just like having conversations back to back. Oh, cucumber, I never cucumber. heard of this. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, it's called miming. So, yeah, yeah. so in other words. Yeah, but apparently cucumber yeah. and rhubarb has the, yeah. the best the best lip movement. Rhubarb. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, the other one I was taught was peas and carrots. Peas and carrots, peas and carrots. Oh, there we go. It's like that, yeah. And I did a Saturday Night Live. I had to mime on on that uh, uh, as well. And, and uh, we talked about Fred Armisen. He's a, he wound up becoming friends with me and Jesse too. And uh, yeah, he, 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 we had a mime on that. But the miming's annoying, you know, but we do what we got to do. We got to make it look good, you know. Johnny, Even we click glasses. We don't click. We use our finger to bump like this. Ah. And then they in the sound studio later on, they yeah. add the sound. That's 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 the guitar player in my band, an incendiary device. Yeah. Sean Brennan is a Foley artist. Mm. And he's a Foley He actually just got nominated for two Emmys uh, for his work on uh, The Bear and, and something else. So the guitar player in my band's up for two Emmys as a Foley artist. That's what a Foley artist does. A Foley artist does all the stuff, all the all the stuff in the background. They recreate it in the studio. Right. Post, yeah. Like Post. if a girl has high heels and she's walking across the room, she could interrupt one of the syllables of one of the words. Yeah, that's right. So that's they right. get her shoes and they put pads on the bottom of her heels. That's right. And then later on, your guy goes. That's like right. He adds the sound. For those that may not know, that's a Foley artist. Hey, Johnny, didn't we see you in Boardwalk Empire? <laughs> I don't think anybody saw me. I was a I was in the background gambling in a brothel with the money. <laughs> like the money was really big, but that was another Scorsese day where yep. uh, you know sometimes he'll he, he'll. He'll talk to the extras. Of course, yeah. he's really cool. And the yeah. guy he uses for the music, Stuart Lerman, is mm -hmm. Willie Nile's producer. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he just did uh, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. He got an Emmy for the music for Boardwalk Empire. Okay. And yeah, so there's a lot of connections there. Are, I are you, are you, that are day too, are you familiar with that over there, uh, Robbie? Do they have Boardwalk Empire? Yeah, over yeah, there? they do. That, that's the one that was uh, Steve Buscemi, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wound yeah. up being stand in one day on that film. Yeah. It was fucking great. But you see the way they cut my hair and they, they fucked my sideburns up. I didn't want to work on films where they want to cut my hair anymore. If, if this is Boardwalk Empire also, right? No, this is Gotham, which is- Oh, our, Gotham. Batman. Yeah, they, the, the Penguin, uh, in this scene, the Penguin had a bunch of people dressed like him in order to raid this house to try to kill the mayor or whatever the scene was. So they dressed me up like him. There's wow, actually is... tons of the, the DC stuff is actually- being filmed over here in, in, in Glasgow a lot of the time. Is that uh, you've right? had like, yeah, yeah, the new Batgirl and things like that because um, the, the, they're saying that Glasgow, well, New York was based off Glasgow, the city blocks thing. So they're using it because apparently our Scots are cheap. <coughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> they're yeah. using Glasgow as as a backup for, for New York and for Gotham right. City. They're using it more and more. Well, right. we've talked about this many times. You want to shoot New York, go to Toronto. Toronto, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That there's tons right. of things in Toronto about, yeah. That, and and that's why Robbie, for what we're talking about, you know, for 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 our collaboration, you mm -hmm. know, uh, which is moving forward, finders keepers. You want to shoot New York? We might end up in Newark, New Jersey, or Camden, yeah. New Jersey, yeah. or Patterson, New Jersey, because yeah. who needs the, who needs the friggin' hassle of right. shooting in fucking New York City? Yeah. If the buildings are old enough, they look they look good. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good to me. Um, keto, keto simple asks, how hard is it to make a living doing this type of work? Background work? Yeah. You can't rely on it. I yeah. mean, there are some people that do and they're yeah. in with the casting, the people right. that cast. Right. If you could get a few days a, a week if this work, obviously after the strike is over. Right. No right. Right now. But, um, if you get a few days a week, you could do okay. But if you rely on it and then you don't get work for that week, and you, you know, then what? You always have to have kind of like being a musician. You got to have in New York. You got to have other things. You know, sure. I, sure. I, I'm very busy as a musician. I don't necessarily have to anymore, right. but I still do because yeah. you know I'm a psycho and I like I, I have <laughs> work ethic. Yep, and if yep. I get days off and someone's asking me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. Tell us about working on The Sopranos. What was that like? That 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 sort of cat that 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 environment. 
well, the, the we were there in holding. They had money to burn back then. We were in holding for four days before this day. And then on the fourth day, yeah, and they, they had used my car in the parking lot. Uh, but uh, they had us in there. And then on the fourth day, they said, hey, you and this guy, why don't you go downstairs and watch in the bada bing, watch the girls dance around the pole. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be difficult, right? <laughs> I sit there. And at, back then, they were already syndicated to A&E. So they had the girls with their tops on. Instead of blurring it out, they were already syndicated to A&E. So they would film the, the scene twice. They film it with the girls with the tops on. And then they would say, okay, girls, tops off. And then they would film them, you know, topless. Whoa. So we watched that go on. And so then is that, is, is that what this is? is yes. That... What happens in this scene is, is, is that this where the, yeah. See the girl. Yeah. She's yeah. naked. Yeah. And this is February, mind you, <laughs> that was freezing out. So yeah. the scene is they hear gunshots in the bottom, in, inside. And everybody, including the girls, comes running out, you know, not reality, but whatever, comes comes running out to see what's going on. But we're standing there, and these girls have, like, these blankets on. But when they say rolling, you know, the PAs come and take the blankets off. That's and they right. get goosebumps from head to toe. Oh. And just next to me, you know, she's naked with just a G-string. And I'm like this. I'm like, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look. And, you know, but these guys are idiot guys. Again, dumb extras, right? They don't know how to respect people. They're just like, oh, it's cold out, huh? Like making comments. Yeah, yeah. Girls are uncomfortable as it is. Give me a break, right? Well, well, that that's it's like it's like one of the first things I said. You yeah. need to, if you're going to do this kind of work, a big, big, big part of it is you got to know how to act. I mean, I mean, and I don't mean literally be an actor, but you got to know how to how to hold yourself. You can't yes. get on the set. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's like that's yeah. a big part of it. And then, but then. I'm trying not to look. And then she tries to get warm. So what does she does? She starts fucking jumping up and down to get warm. So I'm like, oh my God. So I look and she had the fake ones, you know, the, the right. cheaper fake ones. Because okay. the expensive ones got some movement. So it just looked like this. They didn't move. <laughs> so I'm like, oh God, now I wish I didn't look. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, uh, did, did, did you oh, work? Were you, this is Wes Craven. Yes. Um, who's, who's, you know, we're, we're, of course, we're all big fans of some of his work. Yeah. Um, did you work with Wes? I did. I was a stand in for John McGarrow. John okay. McGarrow is the actor that later he, he was in the movie, the David Chase from the Sopranos made after the Sopranos called, uh, uh, not fade away. I stood uh, in on that where I hung out with David Chase and all those guys and little Steven was executive producer. Then a few years later, we did, well, actually, this might have came first. This was 2008 or 10. I don't remember. But anyway, I was a stand in for John McGarrow on this film, and it was called Our Souls to Take. John McGarrow, just so people know who he is, he later was the young Silvio in the prequel to The Sopranos. What Newark. was that called? Lords of Newark? Saints of Saints Newark. Saints of Newark? Saints yeah. of Newark. So John's a good friend of mine. He's a, we became buddies. He's a great guy. And his cousin is the singer of the band, uh, is Jeremy from Jeremy and the Harlequins. He's oh, wow. Band. Uh, so, Rick, Rick, Rick Russ says, Not Fade Away was great. The soundtrack kills as well. They, they just did. They didn't have a cover band do the Stones. He bought the rights to the Stones songs. Like, yeah, Damn. it was killer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was an interesting movie, but yeah, Wes Craven, just to stand there as a stand-in and watch him coach the actors, people would pay to do that. Wow. And I was just standing there, again, nothing, just watching and listening, and I only spoke when I needed to, you know, not like I am in real life, like this, where I come yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm that's, the thing that. with, that's the thing with, I find with some extras, they're, they're actors that want to make it, right? Yeah. They're yeah. for a reason. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, yeah, there's networking and stuff, but you do find that a lot of actors can be these larger-than-life characters and stuff, but you need to know when to reel it in and control yourself. Like you said, Drew, it's acting. You've got to know how to act. There's a certain etiquette rather than being like, well, it's all about me, 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 right. even if you're just it's, it's, a guy in the background. And, and like, Yeah, look, and Robbie, like, I'm a, look, I talk with my hands, but when you're doing yeah. film, as you know, this reads gigantic like it is right now, right? If I talk, if I'm like this and I just talk like this, it reads just fine. If I do one little move like that, it's a big deal on yeah. film. Yeah. Some of these people don't know and they just overact. Everything with them is overacting. I try mm -hmm. to do the opposite. I'm in a film, I do some real acting 
if you want to call it that. I don't think I'm any good, but there's a series called The Gossip and Grams with my good buddy Andy Poland. And, and we're doing that and we're filming and she's going to edit it and start releasing those. Uh, it's like a, a sitcom about grandmothers gossiping. It's a funny thing. And I was also, uh, I did some real acting in uh, Staring at the Sun, which is Jesse Malin's guitar tech, Harry Greenberger's film. He just had Christina Ricci in one of his new films with Paul Barra was in it. Well, 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 Harry Green, Harry, uh, is one of Jesse's guys, right? Yeah. Is it Harry's like Jesse's tech, right? Yes, yes. And 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 he's Jesse Mallon's guitar tech, but he is he is a pro, he's a filmmaker who's who's done now he he's in a different bit of a universe um from sort of me and Robbie's world. I mean he does sort of like romantic comedy. He does like romantic like comedies, right? Well, the thing he did, Staring at the Sun, was about two orthodox Jewish girls, 16 years old, running away from Williamsburg, going across the country, running from the religion. What was the name of that? Staring at the Sun. I got, you know what? I got to see that. It was good. Man. Yeah, it was really cool. I got a bit part. That's, that, the one that, that's the one that Paul's in? No, Paul's in another one called uh, Here, uh, uh, Hereafter, and Christina Ricci's ah. in it, and Paul is naked in it. And and as an and Paul like all the extras were there and during the takes like Paul was naked he just stood there naked he didn't even bother covering up Harry told me these funny things all the extras were like flipped out because <laughs> Paul you know Paul don't give a shit yeah Paul's yeah. Paul's Paul's great he's a, he's a big supporter of the show what, yeah, what's, but, what's going on what's going on here what's going on here oh well yeah okay so. <laughs> Willie Niles, uh, he's got a song called Bleecker Street, and we did a video for Bleecker Street, and um, there's a line in the song, uh, uh, the lady with the jewels and the Nikon wants to uh, photograph another souvenir, whatever, looking for a New York icon, whatever the words are. So I said, hey, I'll dress in drag, and it'll be funny. So I dress, I got these, it was near Halloween where we where we filmed, so I got there, I went to the store, and I got all this this outfit, and I think I'd look a little more like Dean County than anything else. <laughs> right, right. That's yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, I, I, anything I, for a laugh. <laughs> and 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 last, but once again, I just want to just get some perspective on this. Now, it, it, when when you do something like this, are you still literally being paid just as a basic base extra? This is just extra work. Yeah, I mean, before I was in the like. I, I started doing this in the end of 2006, uh, seven, oh. a, and um, I think probably years before that, they used to pay extras a little more. They would call it featured extra. Featured. So you're an extra. You're not just a blur in the distance. We're going to use you for something. In commercials, they actually still pay not people. There's background and foreground. Right. So like for instance, you ever remember those commercials, the Verizon commercials? Can you hear me now? And they're sure. like, of course, four or five people. And then like a thousand of them behind. So yes, the of course. People in the front, if if that happened today, they would get they would get paid special, and they would get residuals and everything for being in the foreground. But they only do that for commercials these days. So yeah, I just get paid the the for an extra that. Now, of course, you you're you're you you have a SAG card and everything. Yeah, I, I wound up. A lot of these SAG people, like, you know, they get pissed at me because I never did a non-union job. My very first job was with the upright base, and they call that special ability. Special right. ability gets you a waiver. You're waived as union that day. You get three of those, and you could join the union. I did three with the upright base. I worked with the upright base for the you, first you were in the Bruce, You were in the Bruce Willis film, right? Yes, Perfect Stranger with Holly Berry yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, Heidi Klum was in that. The film wasn't that good, but... Um, it did get me uh, my SAG card. It got me two days with the with the with the base. So the, you wow. know, special ability thing and like that. Yeah. And 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 you know, in 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 sort of, I, I don't know, in, in ninety seconds or less, could you could you lay out for us what the what the strike is about? The the well part of, there's a few different parts of it. AI is now you can you, if you have AI and you were like. I need a script. You type in, I need a script, uh, kind of like the Godfather meets, you know, whatever, Jaws. And AI will spit out a script in literally in seconds, or if it's a really long script, a minute. Like it's it's insane how quick it is. 
and all you need is one kind of like someone to just go through it and kind of like pick out what they don't want and they could use it. These writers are fighting literally for their own humanity. Mm. So we're going to see a, we're going to see a Godfather meets Jaws. Yeah. Tomorrow. We're going to make one. (laughs) Shark movies at the moment, they are in. (laughs) The Godfather, it's not been done before. You got all these like, Cocaine shark and everything and all that stuff. It's like, yeah. it is. <laughs> shark, right? well, the shark is selling cocaine. That's yeah. <laughs> for the mob. So, <laughs> so, so, so who needs AI? So, We've got this. <laughs> what's the beef, Johnny? What's yeah? What's so the, that's the beef. Like these now, the AI is going to literally take everybody's job. Right. So they're fighting for. That's one of the things they're fighting for. You know, and, and, and is is is, is what? It, it, what are the is what that that that. AI shouldn't be able to do that, or or, yeah. or the original writers should get uh, residuals, or you know, right? Like they're not getting paid enough, and then AI is coming in and and doing the writing for them, right? Which which is you know, it's just it's just really bad. And there's a bunch of other uh, uh, things they're fighting for, but it's obviously just like anything else. It's money. They want to get paid more. They deserve to get paid more. Yep. They deserve to be treated. They're not getting at the end. The director gets credit for a lot of the writing and sometimes yeah. the writers aren't even in the credits mm-hmm. they're fighting to get literally just to get credit look i wrote this put my name in the credits you know yeah. stuff like that uh, yeah. it's really important i'm surprised it's gone on this long especially when the actor said you know what we're striking too now let's get right. this resolved and it's not regular tv it's not even basic cable it's the streaming networks that are really uh screwing them which is why they did the strike in the first place it's the netflix the disney or whatever the amazon i'm not sure which networks are more guilty than another but right i hope this gets resolved quick you know it's sort of it's you know what it sort of reminds me of it sort of reminds me i I, and i guess this is just history shows us whenever these new platforms or, or or these new these new whether new platforms are developed at first it was you know now this the streaming you know like for, first off everyone signed record deals there were records and then the record company started putting out cds you know right. or a lot of artists then they start doing streaming and right. it's like well wait a second i didn't sign a fucking record contract that that mentioned anything about streaming right you know now so I, yeah Right. And, 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 and basically record record companies kind of a- attitude is sort of like, well, fuck them, uh, let them sue us. It, and knowing that 99% of the people out there don't have the resources to, to, to mount the offensive and sue, you know, but, but, but kiss does, you know, and, and bands, you know, bands like that will, will, will protect themselves. But so I guess, so here comes a new technology AI and we're sort of at that place again right like people saying hey wait a second you know the ai could reproduce bass lines drums and now vocals and lyrics now right you don't need humans anymore with this shit. and That's i right. really feel that um that eventually it's good look we can only fight it so long it's unfortunate but they're trying to put rules into place to protect people from right. this and and I get it. You could use it as a tool, but you can't use it to replace people. That's what the strike is fighting for. And even musicians, like what you know, it's it's just an ongoing thing. Robbie, Robbie, your thoughts on the AI thing? I, I think um, I mean yeah, it's going to put people out of jobs. Um, I know artists as well who who feel similar. However, I, I do think it's here and it's not going to it's not going to go away. I, I think we're somehow going to have to embrace it, but in a sense that remain human and um, utilize it in a way that, that works and people still get paid and, and not get ripped off. You know, like it does have its uses, whether it's kids cheating at homework or. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Right. You want to hear, Robbie, lot. Robbie, you want to hear something messed up? They told me that AI, like background people, right? If mm. you allow them, they will go and they will scan your face and your body. And now they could use you for back, they won't have to hire background anymore. They just put wow. it in. Your yeah. digital wow. yeah. Right? So once wow. they do that, so if they were to scan my body, I would want to sign something that says, every time you use my yeah. image, of course. I want something in the mail. Yeah. Well, and Bruce Willis is Bruce Willis is the first person to, to sign away his digital likeness. Is that right? Yeah. Because 
Well, I think this is probably pre the AI boom, you know, a few months ago uh, because of his his mental condition. He right. he couldn't act so well, so he was the first person to sign his his rights away to be yeah. to use his likeness digitally. So yeah. uh, so so that so they could they could sort of uh, um, uh, digitally create him and exactly because yeah because he's he's got some sort of mental problem. Uh, right. I can't remember if it's um, right. Dementia. amnesia or something yes, yeah yeah, yeah. Right. When, he, when he can't remember lines and he's, he's got to yeah, have yeah, a new yeah. ear, ear right. in. so i think it's just like all right we're going to make a a bruce willis film but you know sure. have, have somebody stand in and uh, right. and so you know look like him yeah you know you know it should be interesting well it should be interesting when it when ai gets to the point where like give me a new biohazard song and like <laughs> They give you know, and you're like, "Wow, this is great! I love it!" Right? They've, like, done, that, they've done that already with the ACDC. They, they asked AC, they were like, "AI, make a new ACDC song," and it was pretty good. It sounded like an really? ACDC. We're yeah. already there, Drew. We're already there. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Already there's, there. There, was, there was one I heard on the radio. It was like some stupid cheesy pop song. And it was like, "What would it be like if Metallica covered it?" And it was like, "Wow, this is," yeah. and you know, it's it's like. It's not cool. quite there you know it's like 95 percent there or, or look think about architects right you hire architects to build a skyscraper mm. right. now ai could do all the all the blueprints and right. all you need is like one architect to go through it like you said like it's almost there you need somebody to go through it and just pick a few yeah. things boom give it to the builder done now architects are out of business wow yeah that's the world we're in right now it's insane. Yeah, uh, uh, Rick says says a AI is going to take over entertainment. Yeah, yeah. because you you know, uh, and I have a theory it, it, is that we're dinosaurs and we're going to die off. Right. The kids that are coming up, you know, don't have these references that we have. Right. You know. So and and I've said this on the show a couple of times. My dad was a film director. I, I grew up in a family of filmmakers. My 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 uncle was a, was a. Um, a film editor. He worked on the Hustler. He worked on, you know, uh, you know, did uh, did all the Miller Light commercials. My brother's a my brother's a, a director, cinematographer. So I, I grew up, I grew up in around those. My kid, who who whose girlfriend is a aspiring young director, you know, 20, 20, 21, 22 years old, whatever. They've never even seen The Godfather. They've never seen. Uh, good fellas they don't right. know from any of this stuff and they don't care right you know what what resonates for them are films like from their generation and you know stuff you know and 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 when we talked to my dad about it who's 90 dad said hey let me let me, let me put up the uh the, the words of wisdom from arnie stone uh banner there um dad said you know what when i got into the business I didn't go back and watch the silent films, even though those were the building blocks to when I came into business, it didn't really matter to me. You know, I was interested in what was going on in that moment. So I think that's sort of the, the, the precedent to sort of, you know, uh, kids today or, or, or whatever, you know, with this AI thing, we're going to die off. And the kids that are, that are coming up now, this is going to be the way they think of the business. The, pro the yeah. problem I, I have with that is, Art, art is from the human soul, and and of when course. you get computers to to replace art, and it's already happening. Like if I'm if, even if I go to record a song, they're like, oh, you know, I could move this with the computer, yeah. and it's like, no, 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 I may not want it to be perfect. I may want it to lag a little in this part. That's right. Oh, did somebody played a bad note. I might want to leave that bad note because there's a human element. You listen to all, all old Rolling Stone songs. I, can, I was just I was just about to say uh, he's that fucking Keats out of tune. This yeah. guy's play, this guy's playing ahead of the beat. Leave it alone. Sometimes you got to leave it. But the computers are making everything. It's, it's ruining the art of the world. That is my problem. Art is so important. That's important. A painter yeah. who painted to, art. You yeah. to, count, to counter it though, to, you you got the AI thing going on, right? But also there's this resurgence in especially sort of like action movies and effects driven stuff people are sick of cgi because a lot of the time it's rubbish you just right. instantly tell that just looks like fake yeah. so the, the, there is this uh, hark back to the golden age um of, of using practical effects whether it be blood squibs or 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 um you know miniature models you know like 
the, there is this whole whole sort of scene. Everybody's going back to that because everybody's sick of CGI. So you know, you know, they, there's something that, that's countering the the AI in in a sure. sense. Um, uh, like which I'm, I'm to, all for it. You know, like people going back to vinyl in our world in the music mm. world, right? Yeah. Going back to analog. Thank God somebody has a a thought about going back to some reality. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I think that I think there will always be some sort of grassroots movement, you know, at, at any given moment. Uh, you know, we just hope that 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 it, it uh, you know, it's not just some little uh, small fraction. Right. You, you know, you just hope that, you know, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's a, it's it's large, you know, it's not just like some kind of, oh yeah, there's, hey, there's a couple of weird people that actually make their own art. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. You, you know, it's like that yeah. kind of thing. Well, look, hey, let me, uh, let, let me, let me take my last sponsor break. Robbie, Robbie, you want to hang out a little bit? I know it's late over there. Yeah, I might need to say night night to some of the kids. So, <laughs> All right, go ahead. so, so, so let, let me thank you for coming on. And cool. uh, Johnny, you know, good to meet you. And, and I am based off some of your stuff. We should chat sometime because uh, I think we know a lot of the same people. Uh, my, my dad, he, he worked for Ramones, Blondie, The wow. Alarm even. Um, and even with my tour and I think some of the South American connections with Marky Ramon, we might know some of the same people. Uh, so, we'll, find each, cool. we'll find each other on the, the Facebooks. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, 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 and Robbie, and, and Robbie I, I want to say to everybody out there, uh, Robbie's coming to town. We are screening Dick Dynamite. Yeah. At, the night, at the Nighthawk Cinema. This is going to be exciting. I, I am moderating the Q&A. It is the American premiere. Uh, tickets are on sale now, September 7th at the Nighthawk Cinema. I am moderating the Q&A with Robbie, Vinny Stigma, and um, the actor uh, Dick Valentine. Dick Valentine, yeah, from Electric Six. Shout out to Craig Matthewman, by the way, who knocked out this amazing poster in, like, no time. Yes. It's yeah. awesome. Congratulations yeah. on that, brother. This is great. I can't wait to Here's see it. 20. Yeah, yeah. Come and see it. Thanks, Tell Robbie. I'll, 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 I'll talk to you soon. And we got we got a, a production sure. meeting on Friday. Sounds good. All, All right. right, Johnny. Good, good to meet you, man. You too. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll get you on catch up. <laughs> there you go, brother. Oh, what a cool guy, Robbie's a man. He's great. I can't wait to well, see that film. Yeah, well, I'll let you know. Um, I'll let you know if you want to come. Yeah. Uh, Listen, you know, he played guitar in The Exploited. He played with Billy Biohazard, you know, my boy. Um, you know, I started talking to him on Facebook a while back. He sent me the film. I watched it. I was blown away by it. I had him as a guest on the show. And, and we've just been talking. We have a lot in common. And uh, now we formed an alliance, uh, my new film, Finders Keepers. I'm flying him and the two cinematographers from Dick Dynamite over here to wow. do a week of pre-production on, on my film Finders Keepers. Dude, I, I can't wait to see that. That's yeah, amazing. Great. In the production hey, uh, let me do a quick uh, sponsor thing. We'll come back yeah. we'll take some questions from around the world, okay? That's great. Love it, man. Yeah, man. Well, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by blah, 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 and Upstate Records. They're a, DIY, they're a New York-based DIY independent metal and hardcore label. Founded in 2017, they broke into the scene with their inaugural 26-band compilation and since then have churned out over 80 releases in their brief five-year history. Out now are new releases by Mark Rizzo's band Revenge Beast, Carl from Earth Crisis' is Freya, Fury of Five Angry Corpses with a few more surprises in the works. Check them out and a whole lot more at www.upstaterecordsnewyork.com. Use the code STONE10 for 10% off. Hey, uh, we're doing questions, so... Uh, I know people have been asking through the show, uh, through the whole show. Please repost them for Johnny, for Johnny Pie, or anything else uh, regarding uh, the show. Me, Johnny Pie, his acting, his re repost. Uh, last but not least, looking for extreme vinyl? DTFM Vinyl has got you, my friend. Located on 13th Ave in Fargo, North Dakota, we have the state's best selection of punk, hardcore, Mel Scott, Oi, and more. Can't make it in? Shop online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com. DTFM Vinyl, where the policy still is and always will be. Death to false metal. Uh, just a reminder, um, I'm going to be in South Carolina, in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, screening my new film, The Jews and the Blues, which incredibly 
is still doing the festival circuit, um, uh, temples, synagogues. Um, listen, once in a while, you know, you end up a film ends up with the right distributor. We did here with this film with Manemsha Films. Uh, we're out there. I'm coming down. If you are in that area, I am told, uh, you know, over 200 tickets have been sold. I'm coming down with my significant other, Rochelle. Uh, love to see you. Uh, and then we'll be back, of course, a week from today with Kevin Sharp. That said, um, please post your questions. Let's um, let's bring our guest. <laughs> I, 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 uh, all this time, I, I keep thinking about it. I need to say it. Um, our buddy, this guy who's done so much for everybody, yeah, definitely have uh, any benefits that have uh, that have been had. He's, I, I did a show with him raising money for this girl in the UK for a new wheelchair, like years ago, and he just kept doing benefit after benefit and helping people. Jesse Mallet. Yep. He had a, a spinal stroke, which is a very rare thing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and his legs, he, he doesn't have use of his legs. He's paralyzed from the waist down. And uh, he can really use people's help. On the top of my Facebook and uh, my Facebook pages, uh, there's, a, there's a link, Sweet Relief. And uh, if anybody yeah. would uh, just look into it and want to donate a little money, he's going to maybe, with any luck, you know, there's treatments in other countries that maybe they're not allowed to do here. I don't know. We're grasping at straws. We'll do whatever we can sure. to, to get Jesse uh, to get Jesse back. And, and Jesse, Jesse, oh, uh, yes. if you're watching, you know, um, huge supporter of my endeavors. I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for his support with the show. All these Bowery Electric shows we do. Uh, Jesse Mallon, I, I say it many, many times. He's the patron saint uh, of these of these bar free, free all ages Bowery Electric shows we do because Jesse Mallon, as a very young musician, knows the value and how important it is to have the venue and, 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 and the opportunity for these young people. So he, he's a big part of it. 13 year um, old heart attack singer. Yeah. <laughs> Running around. Yeah. He's let's, the man, man. Absolutely. Let's start with this. Okay. Uh, you know, our, our big friend Rick says, I'm a big Ryan Adams fan. How did you get hooked up with him? Well, I was uh, with Jesse. You know, uh, uh, Ryan produced uh, Jesse's first record, The Fine Out of Self-Destruction. And Ryan, he recognized the magic, what was happening in that room. And he wanted to recreate a similar kind of magic on his records. So he took not just me, but he took Jesse Mallon's band. It was- Oh, I see. He Paul he co-opted co the band. He took, he took us, yeah. So it was yeah. me, Paul Garisto, Joe McGinty, uh, uh, Johnny Rocket, I think was at the time was there. Right. And um, the, the thing, the difference is, you know, with Jesse, uh, Jesse's a rehearsal guy and, and I respect that. He wants things to be polished. He wants you to get, all, he wants to flush out all your ideas. He wants you to flush out your ideas. He wants to flush out his ideas. So we rehearse a lot. So when we go into the recording studio, yeah, there's a little room for spontaneity here or there, but we all have our shit down and we're tight. I right. know every note that keyboard player is going to play. So I know when I'm playing, I'm not going to step on it. We're not going to step on each other. Sure. And therefore, we could concentrate more on the sounds and production, you know. Ryan Adams is the polar opposite where he's like, all right, I want you guys to come in. And I'm like, great, well, you know, email me the songs. He goes, no, nah, you know, just listen to some, you know, he gave me some band references and I'm like, Okay, cool, but you know, why don't you give me a song so I could, I'll prepare some stuff. I'll have a few ideas, you know, whatever you like. I'll write a, you know, I'll write a great baseline for you. Give me a minute, you know. Nothing. He gave us zero. We walked into songs, literally. He would like. He starts to play, and I'm like, cool. So I'm watching his hands, so I know where the changes are. No, nothing on paper. Nothing. And I'm watching his hands. I'm like, okay, it's this, it's this, it's this. D, D to C to G, okay. But I'm doing it by not knowing what's coming next. There's a bridge. I'm like, okay, you know, okay. Meanwhile, the sliding, room, sliding up, hitting the wrong note and sliding up to the right note. You know, that's what we do. Try to fake our way through it. Sure, sure, sure. Dude, little did I know the record button is on and that's the take. So we all looked at each other and went, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I'm just getting, I'm just getting a feel of this. He goes, no, that was great. I'm like, what do you mean that was great? I don't even know what you, I don't even know what I just did. 
So like as as I'm following his fingers, like if it's going like you know from C to A or whatever, I might have did a walk into A. Sure. When he hung on A, I might have did a little something. Sure. All everything, mistakes and all, are on those records. Love is hell part one. Love is hell part two. Four songs off of each, and I played on two songs off of rock and roll. Um, one of those songs, what is a uh, anybody want to take me home? Is on the rock and roll record. Those are actually from the Love Is Hell sessions. sessions yeah. And then there was another, like a double record, uh, Love Is Hell, I guess. And uh, there were some extra songs we did, like Fuck the Universe, whatever was on there. He had some girl. Uh, he he wrote a bunch of things in English, and she said it in French. In French, and I had my little phone, my flip phone at the time, and her voice is coming out of the phone into the microphone. And you know, I was playing on, like a, on a beer bottle at one point, <laughs> like weird shit. Marianne Faithful comes in, and 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 she sang uh, 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 English Girls approximately. She sang on it with him. Meanwhile, did you know at the time? I mean, it's okay. I say this. There was some drugs going on, and they was pulling all nighters. And I was like, I don't know what's happening here. You know, I wanted to get to the next song. What are we playing next? I'm trying to like figure out what I want to do. He wouldn't teach us a fucking thing. So now there was one of the sessions. This is amazing. What's amazing about him, he was writing the lyrics as we were there too. He didn't even have that finished. Wow. And everything that comes out of this guy is like amazing. He writes mm. little little three note things. It's like a song within a song. This guy's just he's does, incredible. Does, does, does he always record like that, or is this just like this record? I want to do like this. No, I think he mostly records like that. I, you know, if I, I could almost confirm because, because something could, listen, because something could be said for that, right? It's it's yeah. basically the we're creating the magic right here. It's spontaneous. It's in the moment. Yeah, you know, and you know, there 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 are a lot of acts that sort of go for that yeah. and, and 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 there are acts that have strayed from that and it, and it, and it, you know let's bring it let's go instead of like you know working and, and beating the shit out of everything in practice for six months let's just go into this but listen not everybody can do that you right. gotta fucking especially back in the day because who the, fuck is, who the fuck can go into a recording studio and figure out what you're gonna do exactly we were able to do that not my, not my band <laughs> At one point, I think Paul Garisto like stopped playing in the middle of the song. At least if he stops, everything's gonna stop. Sure. Like, all right, listen, we gotta start over. Well, I was like, oh, we got a second take. Wow, this is like you know one of those yeah. kind of things. And I like to fish around and try to find the best thing for your song. Listen to the melody or whatever. Sure. But we sure. he just had his way of doing it. It was it was all spontaneity. Then Incredible. at one time, I went in there. And it was to record Shaller, which was the uh, second song off of that record, Rock and Roll. And um, Jim Barber was producing it at the time. And Jim oh. Barber just came from producing Courtney Love. And I don't know what you know what comping is. Comping is when a singer sings like yep. 15 takes, and they'll take a word from this take and a word from that take, and they'll copy and paste. And, and, Sometimes and it's kind of, cut, cut, kind of cut and paste it all together. Yeah. So he said, I spent an entire weekend comping Courtney Love like one or two songs and I'm here now with you guys and Ryan's like all right I'm gonna sing it I'm like oh great so now he's gonna sing it and take his time and make this great after he just didn't even give me a chance to learn the damn song Drew he walks in there one fucking take sang it one take didn't even come out of the vocal booth and said rewind it I'm gonna do harmonies and I'm like wait a minute what he's like yeah look if I afterwards they're talking to him he's like if I sang a little flat, that's what happened. That's okay. And well, like you, you, you mentioned, uh, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank, but the infamous Rolling Stones record with Torn and Frayed and Happy. Yeah. What's the name of the record? The Rolling Stones record. Um, what, get uh, the live one. Get your yayos out. No, or no, no. The 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 one the the double record. The 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 the, the sticky famous. Fingers? Not is it not Sticky Fingers? The 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 one that that's like. Uh, like the blueprint for the black crows. What the fuck? Um, oh, wait, I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, Happy's on it. Torn right, Trade, right. Shine a Light. Um, right. Oh, those are amazing. And yeah. sometimes you'll hear a, a, a couple of bad notes and and make not it some girl, some not some bad. girls. No, no. The 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 uh, exile on Main Street. I'm oh, sorry. Exile. Thank the, you so much, Charlie. I, I 
I, I just I drew a, I drew a total blank on it, but that is the iconic record of all time. Well, well that's that's always cited as that's always cited as like you know what do you think they had fucking Pro Tools you know when they did fucking Exile on Main Street? No, you know yeah, he sang a little flat. That's the way it was, and they said you know what? And Ryan said it too. If the feel is there, that's right. That's what I'm more important. I don't care if you guys fucked up here and there. Sure. And today they would you know they would make his vocal and they would fix it. And they, he didn't give a fuck. And there it is. And people love it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's organic. It's all very organic. So I had to get, take my musician hat off yeah, and yeah. go, we're going to jam on these chords and whatever happens, happens. And there's a couple of songs I could hear my own mistakes. And I'm like, whatever, man, it's cool. <laughs> all right. Um, you know? Cor Courtney, Courtney asks, Hey Johnny, what is one of your favorite songs, bass lines to play? Can you give us a couple of like your personal favorites? I mean, from, from just sort of like the span of your career, whether it's oh. with Jesse or, or Marky, I mean, is there anything that you, that when it came up, you were always like, man, I fucking, I, I'm, I'm fucking love this. <laughs> well, when it comes to uh, stuff I wrote, if you're talking about that, I mean, I used to love playing Subway with Jesse or TKO, the song I, you know. What, sure, you co-wrote it. Give him a little, give him a little couple of chords for. Yep. Uh, that bass line was always really fun for me. Uh, Bleecker Street with Willie, that bass line. I mean, I'm not tooting my own horn here. It's, it's stuff that I wrote that I love playing. Yeah. But like, you're talking about the universe. I mean, uh, Don't Give Up by Peter Gabriel with Tony Levin playing that crazy, amazing bass line. It like leads the song. Like, there's stuff like that that I just, I love playing. But then on the same token, you give me a song that's just like driving 16th notes and I'll fucking love that too. Any kind of Ramones kind of song or Ramon ish yeah. kind of song where I could just pound out 16 notes. And I, I don't play with a pick. Right. I was going to ask you, you play with your fingers. I use, I use all three fingers. A lot of guys yeah. use only two, whatever. Right. I, I have a couple of tricks. You, ne you never played with a pick? Never, if, never? I did a little bit and just, I found this. I'll give away my secret. I found this little trick where I grow these three nails a little long. Mm. So if I have my hands like this, or if I put them like this, I can get like three pick sounds. It's like having three picks until I break a nail, and then obviously I don't have it. But like, well, what, so I I was gonna say, what, 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 what I was going to say was, people, in some cases, play with a, a pick because of the attack. They they want they want they want the attack. But what you're saying is you grow your nails because when people play with their fingers, it, it's it's a little it's a little soft. They don't have that attack. Although right. people right. will argue Steve Harris from Iron Maiden, and whatever, whatever. They have but, certain amplifiers to get that attack. Yeah, right. they have like certain ways of they they hit the bass pretty hard and they get the attack that way. I get Great the attack. Baseline on "Don't Give Up." Of oh yeah, just incredible. There's some beautiful. I mean Paul McCartney. I mean there's so many beautiful yeah. bass players, bass lines yeah. out there. But if you're talking about my own, yeah, I mean I used to love playing these songs with Jesse and I love playing certain songs with Willie from bass lines I've written. I've had, um, you know, we've had a couple of Jesse's bass players on the show. We had Cat Popper on the show. Yeah. Cat. She's fucking, oh, I love that. One. She's so amazing. <laughs> she's she's great. so great. Great bass player. All attitude, man. She's Talk just... about feel. Right. Talk about yeah. feel. Cat Popper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. A favorite acting role that you've done and anything that you really enjoyed that, um, well, I did. I only did a few short films or the series I'm doing, so I really can't say I have a favorite. I haven't even done enough, you know. I've done mostly background work, but um, yeah. I mean, hopefully, you know, this favorite role will come. I wish someone would give me a, a fucking script where I could study and become yep. this this character, where I yeah, could, yeah. you know, I I want that. I would love to do that one day. If I'm not, let so me busy. ask. Music. Let me ask you. Uh, is there a story behind uh, this sh this shirt, this logo? <laughs> yes, of course there is. So, um, you know, in the, from the punk rock days, I would I would do these jumps, and then there's these you know these people with everybody's got a camera these days, and everybody's a photographer. But some people show up with like real good cameras, and like I um they caught me in mid jump, and so. These, these guys would come and they would try to catch me in mid jump and get that. <laughs> right. So then, uh, this friend of mine, his it, it, John favorite used to be, his name used to be John Rambo. He used to work the door at the scrap bar. 
Yes, of course. Yeah, big, yeah, yeah. Big, big white dude. Everyone's this, asking who this guy is. <laughs> oh, this guy's my yeah. This guy's a dude from the from the UK. So <laughs> he looks like a UK guy. He's just oh, this guy's the best. He's a funny guy yeah. uh, from Leicester, uh, Leicester in, in the UK. Uh, I had to get him an extra large, I think. But um, yeah. So John Rambo, now named John Favorite, he's an artist. He used to do a lot of graffiti art and stuff. He said, "Listen, I want to get this jump." And I want to like do something with it. I, I, I said, yeah, man, go ahead. So he, if you look at that t-shirt, it's just a bunch of lines that create that jump. And then he said, listen, I'm going to make some t-shirts. I want to, I want to give a bunch to you. Maybe you could give them out or whatever. People, those t-shirts became in demand. So I had to buy more and sell some more. So now I have like an Etsy shop, which I, I, there's a bunch of sizes of them. I just don't promote it anymore, but there's a bunch of shirts like that on my Etsy shop. Where you know, if I still have the sizes, I'll I'll I'll, I'll mail them. If to anybody you. wants to get in touch with Johnny, follow him, ask him a question. He's very yep. accessible. His Instagram is at Johnny underscore Paisano. Buy a shirt. Uh, you know, support independent filmmakers Please. and actors. Yeah. I I I love this. Now, is this? Oh, the 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 Coney Island one I just showed. Is that? Yeah. Is, well, that's is, the back of my. Uh, that's in my. Uh, I did a record. You know, just like. Actors want to be musicians. Musicians want to be actors. Well, side men want to be front men. Sometimes we have <laughs> that's right. And I had some songs that that Marky Ramone, like I said, we never did a third record. I wrote with Marky for the second record. We put out a second right. record, but I was writing for the third record because we used to write together. I wrote wrote some on my own for the second record, but um, I had these songs sitting around, so I finished some of them. And I created more songs and I created my own record called uh, Johnny Paisano's Punk Rock Pizzeria, I called it. And uh, um, Kira Caverno, the photographer, we went to Coney Island and she she had me jump and it, uh, uh, behind that parachute, in front of the parachute ride, the famous yeah, parachute I'm, ride. I'm Island, again, so. And that's in the record. So um, yeah, so that record's on Spotify. So this, this yeah. shot is not Photoshopped at all. This no. is actually, done with the perspective of the old uh, parachute job. Uh, in, yeah. in, yeah. in fact, I couldn't get high enough for her to get that angle she wanted. So you know those garbage pails on the boardwalk? I grabbed one. They're disgusting. I grabbed one, turned it upside down, and I jumped off the garbage pail just so she can. She was like laying on the floor just so we could get the angle she wanted to have the parachute ride just in that right spot. Nice. Yeah, this isn't Photoshop. That's yeah. and uh, and Dee Dee, no, no, this is not this is not uh, John Lydon's minder, John Rambo. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <even> know. <laughs> no, I, I I know him. I I I know Rambo, yeah. who who's uh, grew up with John Lydon. Yeah, um, different different guy. Different, different guy. guy. But John John Rambo now I'm John favorite. He lives in San Diego now. Great guy. Got it. Yeah. Uh, let's do one more. How about? Um, Let's see. What is the meaning of life? Let's. That's a. That's a little deep for this show. <laughs> what is the meaning of? You know. Yeah. Uh, well, if you think about it, if we all just were nice to each other, that's what I feel is the meaning of life. Just that. Just take that one sentence. Be nice to each other, and spread it out into every corner of every subject, and every the world will just be a better place. Hey. You know, I close every show with "Do good things, the good things will come to you," and and Absolutely. I do believe that. You know, look at with Jesse Malin. Be more like Malin. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, big supporter of ours, uh, RS Seventy asks, um, "What actor or actress does he want to work with? Is there anybody that you just like, man? This is like, I, this is." Oh yeah, uh, man. Christina Ricci happens to be a favorite of mine. Speaking yeah, of Christina right. Ricci, I, right. I just think she's. Just whatever role she plays, she's just so in it. Sure. Well, if I really yeah. want to get nuts, Juliette Lewis. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I don't think she's acting. I think she's that she's... fucking nuts. That's just her. Do you follow her on Instagram? Yeah, dude. Oh, my God. It's just so. Wow. How do you not, as an actor, how do you not want to just be in any kind of role with her? Just back and forth with her, I'd be like, I'd get probably get dizzy at first. But I, I think I think people like her scare people, scare producers. Cause yeah. you know, yeah, it's a lot to deal with. Oh, you've you know? seen her on that film, Yellow Jackets? No, I didn't see that. Holy no. shit, dude! Yeah, she is just be up above and beyond, and like it's just. And then that's the thing: the people that I think are not acting, like when De Niro 
does a role. I don't think he's acting like someone else. It's just him. He just spits out. Well, that, that, well, 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 Jack Nicholson was the, the <laughs> ultimate sort of like, he would just be him. And, it, you know, when right. you hire Jack Nicholson, yeah. you're getting Jack Nicholson playing yeah. that, like, you yeah. know, yeah. You're, we're not talking about Daniel Day-Lewis here, right? Yeah. We're talking about Jack Nicholson does, hey, it's Jack Nicholson in that part. Yeah, you don't, you don't hire Jack Nicholson to do like the gay lawyer role, you know, like. No, you, you, know. you hire him to be Jack Nicholson. You're fucking Jack Nicholson, right. But Daniel Day-Lewis can do anything. That dude is Johnny crazy. Depp can do anything. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Johnny Depp fan. Uh, Rick Rush, uh, um, I don't think Todd Morris, who has been on the show. Oh, um, oh he was in her band? Oh, that's no. crazy. Yeah, Toby Morris. Well, t uh, Todd was in H2O, of course. Then yes. he was in Juliet and the Licks. But now he's in The Offspring. So I don't know if he's still playing with Juliet. Um, He's in the offspring, and I see they're 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 busy. They're doing they're doing big dates, man. Offspring, so. I didn't even know they were still around. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He started Nitro Records, that dude. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Definitely. Well, I would love to be in a band with Juliet Lewis. That's fucking some real deal shit. shit. Yeah, yeah. He's, he doesn't I love call, when, he, when 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 he was on the show I afterwards, I said, listen, man, we got to get Juliet on the show. He laughed. He's like, yeah, good luck. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, she's good busy. Luck. <laughs> Look at that one, bro. You, you know, so. I love that chick. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. She's there you go. All right, man. Hey, great show. Uh, and I, I really, I thank you, man. You, you know, I really needed it. I really needed you to come on the show. I was really looking forward to it. I knew it was going to be great. I really needed a New York bro to come on the show because lately it's just been crazy. Like guys from all over the world, and yeah. hey, uh, it's like I really needed to like get grounded <laughs> again. With with like with the with the yeah. New York guy, yeah, you know. Well, we're proud New Yorkers. They they try to fuck up our city. They keep trying to fuck it up more and more. That's but right. And, and I'm gonna let you know about Dick Dynamite. Please, right? yes. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know. You know, we're doing we're doing our uh, record release show at um at Jesse's place on November 12th. And Cindy Device, Hell uh, yeah. we have a record coming out. So you you gotta. You gotta you gotta venture out from from the borough and and come come to come hell to yeah play, yeah I've been, you know? I've been busy playing with uh, not just Willie I play with a bunch of bands tribute oh band. yeah you know, you know I I wanted to, I actually wanted to ask you um yeah exactly uh yeah we got to get you and we got to get you and find your keepers man you got to be in our film hell so yeah we we we, we gotta we gotta oh, figure yeah, cool. we gotta we gotta figure that out. But just real quick, I know you're doing. You, I find it really interesting. You're doing, you know, you're doing other work, playing in, in bands like like tribute bands, and uh, you're in a Stones band, right? And and what else? Well, yeah, you know, like I said, like just doing other work, other than you know. And and at first, years ago, 2005, before I started with this, I was like, ah, tribute bands. I, I don't want. I just I'm an original. I always yeah. in original bands my whole life. Very rarely did I do covers. Sure. Sure. Even my, like I said, my first band was an original band, yeah. Blazes, Blazes songs, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, but then I had to like, just, you know, kind of like accept it a bit. Mm -hmm. And now I'm not, either I'm in or I'm a sub or I share the gig. I see. The very first tribute band, the Blushing Brides, the Stones band. Oh, uh, I didn't know you pl you played with the Blushing Brides. Sure. When they, when, when Maurice, Dude, they're, they're like. They are the Stones tribute band. Yes, exactly. When he comes into the States, he uses me and Lee Boyce and Daniel Hoffelberg. Uh, oh, and Lee's in the band too. Yeah, okay. so I'm his bass player when he's in the States. And uh, then um, I'm in a Springsteen band, Saints in the City. I'm in, uh, uh, I share that gig too. You know, we share, I share these gigs. Uh, this guy, Frank, bass player of an ABBA tribute. When he can't do that, he'll call me. And, and there's a Tom Petty band. When that bass player can't do it, John... They call me the damn. Oh, that's a lot, bro. That's like five. Yeah. Oh, Jeff Slate. He does covers and originals. And then William Zahner, who does mostly originals. I'm, I don't, I'm probably missing one right now. There's, there's a ton of them. And which, I'm actually doing. Which of those bands, like, like any of those bands, is it sort of like, like, is it, is it, holy shit, like they draw like a lot of, like, like have like a really solid audience? That you would not believe what the ABBA band can do. You know, we have a friend that's in a, in in the Eagles tribute band. Yeah, yeah. And they sell out like Crazy. they sell out not not clubs. 
They're selling out like theaters. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And part of me, it's sad because these tribute bands make more money yeah. than original bands because of only because of demand, which is great for them. Don't get me wrong, but it's like this is what people do now. They want to, they like this. Instead of like back yeah. in the day where people wanted to go see art, they want to yeah. see people doing other people's art and sure. they want to see it done. Like when I do a cover, my old band, Crispy Brown, when we did a cover, it was unrecognizable. We would right. do ska punk version of Hotel California, sure, Hotel sure. California, and we would do like 90 miles an hour. Like with Marky <laughs> Marley and Tudors, Marky Marley and Tudors, we did Nowhere Man by the Beatles, 90 oh, miles an hour. That's a good one. That's how I look at covers. But yeah, yeah. when it comes to this stuff, people love these tributes. And some of them are clone bands. You're never going to see me wear a fucking wig or any crap. Yeah, like yeah, that. no, you, yeah. yeah. But, you know, they get nuts. Yeah, yeah, right. The Eagles tribute band played Hampton Beach Casino. Yeah, Casino. <laughs> on that, yo, they also played right here, uh, right across in Jersey, right where is the theater? I saw Anthrax and all that. They right. fucking, fucking, fucking huge, huge, man. It's amazing and good. Again, good for them. I'm not downing anyone. I'm, I'm part of it, right? You know, yeah. I want to make money no, playing. No, music. no, it's, it's, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah it, it, oh, oh, I meant to, I wanted to mention that. So, Biohazard Management has manages a bunch of acts and we were out in LA for the rehearsals for, for, for what they were doing. And they said, Hey, we got this other act playing. They sold out the, the El Ray theater, you know, you guys want to go. And we were like, all right, what is it? It was a uh, Yachtly crew. Right? <laughs> Yachtly crew. Oh, does that, so does the Yacht Rock thing, right? Yes. It's the Yacht Rock thing. Yeah. Right? So oh. we go, it's sold out. The whole audience is wearing these like captain's caps yeah. and everybody's singing along, you know, Brand this the sailor said Brandy, you're a fine girl. And it was just like, holy, who the fuck knew? Is that amazing? I know. It's wow. crazy. Yeah, yeah Danny funny. knows they're amazing. It was like what yachtly crew. And and they really they go through the whole gamut, you know, of, awesome. of like, you know, I, I gotta admit, I love most of those songs. I love all yeah. that. I love yeah. Brandy and all those songs yeah. from back then, the seventies. I uh, I have to like do all this homework for these yeah. gigs. The hardest part is knowing the material. Is that so right? Like, well, I've done so many hours and hours of homework just to have these gigs. Yeah, yeah. It, it is easier to show up without having to do any preparation on a film set, right. or like I'm yeah. a prop I'm a prop assistant on Saks Fifth Avenue modeling shoots. Sometimes sure. I do some other jobs, but I'm still want I still want to be a musician. You know, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just wondering who out of all you just. Who probably has the most difficult songs, you know? Oh, or, dude, Springsteen. You have no idea how Gary hard Gary Talent, is. right? Gary Talent? Gary's amazing bass player. Yeah. He's all over the place and never right. got away with getting being busy. And he's and, still he's still in the band, right? Oh yeah. I mean, he uses other people once in a while, but when he uses I know, but, but he's he's been with him since the beginning. Oh, yeah, dude. From way back. Before. I mean, listen, Clarence yeah. Clemens is gone. His his yeah. son plays right, and right. and uh, yeah. and this, you know, the the, the keyboard player is not the original. The, but that guy, Gary Talent, I think has been with him since fucking day one. Yeah, him and and Mar uh, yeah, him and Max. Yeah, they're just yeah. amazing, man. But some of those songs, like you hear, Warren Max Weinberg's not a right. Max Weinberg wasn't with him in the beginning. You know who? You know oh, who? Vinny right. Lopez. It was Vinny Lopez. Yeah, of course. I'm friends with Vinny. I, I knew yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Vinny's an awesome guy. Is he? And then Max wound up playing on uh, the Meatloaf stuff. Right. He played on Bad Out of Hell shit. That's right. It's insane. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah, but that's... like you're saying, what songs are difficult? Yeah. I, Born to Run, song you know your whole life. But yeah, yeah. pick it up and you go to play it, you're like, oh my God, there's like three songs in one. It's like a Broadway musical. Yeah. Rosalita's like that. Wow. Thunder Road is like that. These songs, no are like, yeah, they're long and they go. It's almost learning like a prog rock song. It's like, holy shit, this guy created these masterpieces. And then yeah. you got the really simple ones like, you know, Born in the USA and Dancing in the Dark. Or, or what's the other one? Um, My Hometown, right? I mean, My stuff hometown, like that's yeah. pretty, pretty basic, right? I mean. Yeah, it, it has a couple of twists and turns. But yeah, not, yeah. some of these songs, I'm like, holy shit, this isn't easy. <laughs> I had to like, I had a shed at home. I had to like you know, drill it over and over, you know? Yeah. Cause I like, I don't, I try not to use charts on these gigs. 
I can write my own chart. I don't read music, but I have a way of writing my own charts. Yeah. I do cheat sheets if I have to, but sure. I have I have more fun if I don't have to. So right. I might do cheat sheets for one or two, but it's more fun for me to play and look out and look at the musicians of I'm course. playing with rather than stand and the audience doesn't want to see somebody. Well, it's, it's also, it, I, I, I'm going through this now with, with the band I'm in. I've hit the point where I really know the material. Yeah. So I'm on stage now and it's just like, I, I don't stress it at all. You know, I, I just sort of, I just sort of like zone out and stare at, you know, stare at the disco ball or whatever. It's great, man. It's a great place to be. You yeah, know, as a musician, when you re when you know the material and 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 you're up there and you're sort of in the zone and yeah. you know, uh, that's I, I like I believe in the Jesse Mallon school of rehearsing or home do so much homework right. that when you get there you just know and then yeah. you just have to feel each other out and, sure. and create sure. that that vibe you know yeah, yeah the rehears rehearsing thing is 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 interesting you know expensive uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 right <laughs> yeah. well you know what we do now we were well. We we've been rehearsing, but um, we usually rehearse once before a show. Go through the set twice. Yeah. Well, you if know. you guys know it, that's it. Yeah, like what my you know with punk rock pizzeria. Yeah. I've I've done a bunch of shows, and it's yeah, it's yeah. being the guy is a lot harder yeah, than yeah. just being the bass player. I think it's hard sometimes just being the bass player of the guy, but sure. being the front guy, you have a lot of responsibility, you know, and um. Yep. Yeah, like that. That uh, you, the, the song you opened with, "Midlife Crisis," that's on that yeah. record. Sure. Um, that was that, that was a light of day show for the Parkinson's right. Youth benefit. Right. And was that down I, in the Jersey Shore? That was the light of day, and that was Derek from Jesse's band. I noticed Derek Cruz. Cruz. And that yeah. was uh, Arlen Phyllis on the other guitar and keyboard. Who's playing drums? And that was Weber. That was John Weber. That was John Weber? Yeah, he's an animal, dude. And that was John Weber with the with the. I did not yeah, recognize he's got that nothing. John Weber. This guy's got great hair. <laughs> Him and Willie have great fucking hair. I didn't recognize that as John Weber. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, and on the record, it was Alex Alexander playing drums and Matt Hogan on guitar. But um, the song All Fucked Up From Growing Up, that song is John Weber. Wow. And we recorded it in Rivington Studios in the, in the, the basement. Anybody you want to shout out? Anybody you want to thank as we head towards the door? I have to thank... Mark Newman, because if it wasn't for him, none of my life would be anything close to being like this at all. Oh, and man. then, and then, you know, through the Marky Ramon gave me street cred for whatever reason. And then Jesse Mallon took the reins from there and he decided like, I, I don't know, in his brain, I guess he said, listen, I think you're really great at what you do. And I want you to, I want to introduce you to this person or this person. He got me gigs. And if it wasn't for Mark Newman and, and Jesse Mallon, I don't, I'd, I'd have a completely different life. Maybe I'd still be with FedEx. I, I don't know. You know, I really don't. So yeah, those, yeah. those, especially there's so many people, but those two guys, especially it's like a tree. It had to have a seed, right? There had to be a root and they'll tell me, oh yeah, but it's you that you became the musician you are. I said, yeah, but there's so many great musicians that don't have the opportunity. Yeah. And even me, I'm not at a big level. I don't mm -hmm. look at myself as a big level, you know, I'm still working side jobs and do whatever, but, mm -hmm. but wherever I am, I'm very appreciative of, and I'm appreciative of those guys, you know. Fantastic. Well, thanks, man. Uh, I'll be in touch. Uh, you, we want you to come, me and Robbie want you to come to the Dick Dynamite screening. Yeah, so man. I'll let you know. And if there's a role, you need me to spit out a yeah. couple of things, I'll do it. Oh yeah, we'll do it, man. We'll you do it. Fall on somebody in a fucking film. I'll get I'll get him against the wall. <laughs> you're you're going to hear from us soon. All right, bro. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Thanks, Drew. Thanks so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Bye bye. Bye. Well, there you have it, man. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed today's show, at least half as much as I did, because I really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, to do something I love and and for supporting me. And you know what? This is one of those cause and effect shows because during the show, I want to shout out uh, a new patron, uh, Alan Sproul. Sproul, am I pronouncing that right? Man, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, the show does need support. Um, you know, it's been a little while now. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you know, no problem. It was drowning in support. Uh, things have stretched out a little bit now. Show needs your support. Uh, there's the Patreon page. There's a PayPal. Please, 
don't be shy let it fly um you know thank you uh, i know right robert <laughs> it was great great show today oh that's you hey al al thank you buddy that, that there's something when i do the show and you know someone joins patreon during the show it's like cause and effect it really it just just keeping it you know uh, it, it just makes me feel great. Like it's a cause and effect. Like I'm doing a great show and people are loving it. And, and, and Kenny Clark, thank you, bro. And, uh, and, and all that. So, you know, Betty, 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 Betty Paisano is, is that, uh, who's that Johnny? Is, is, is that, is that wife, mother, sister? Mother. What? That's my mother. I didn't know she was watching. <laughs> Betty Paisano, hey. Well, I yeah. mentioned her a bunch of times. You want to talk about my work ethic? It comes from her and my father. Those, of course. That's, that's, that's real. Awesome. Don't she? She is uh, old school. You know, people just they don't make it like make people like that anymore. You know. You know now that you're back on the show. Um, <laughs> you know, from time to time, people ask me like, "Oh, Drew, you're an animal. How do you do, Drew?" And you know what it is for me. It's all the work. It's all the work ethic that was handed down to me from my father. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, man. All right. I'll talk to you later. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Betty Paisano. Hey, you got a great son. We really enjoyed him. Uh, we really enjoyed him uh, on the show today. Uh, that's right. <laughs> you have a great son there. Fantastic. Hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we'll see you. We'll see you. Um, hopefully, I'll see you. If you're down in uh, South Carolina for the new film or a week from today, we will be back with Kevin Sharp. So there you go. Um, let me clear the deck. Everybody good? Yes, Johnny's mom. Fantastic. That's great. We'll see you soon, everybody. Until then, do good things, the good things will come to you.